language, culture, heritage, and the arts from October 5th to the 7th. Make sure you're the day. All we know that you are the day. Were well, you on the October 5th to the 7th? Heritage Education Network believes culture symposium, community issues, and innovative practices. Make sure you join with our Facebook and YouTube. I want the day. You better the day. Good afternoon and welcome back to Heritage Education Network Belize Day 2 Culture Symposium. I am your host, Lenmara Rosado. I hope that we have all had a healthy lunch and we are ready for this afternoon's lineup. This morning, we began with a variety of presentations about Belize's historic context and how modern societies have used and innovated the teachings of our ancestors through literature, folklore, or entrepreneurship. Our afternoon session will continue with innovative practices through themes such as globalization and resilience. As Belizeans continue to progress and learn more about their heritage, we find that traditional knowledge is not as foreign as, as some might like us to believe. Our first presentation embodies this afternoon's theme, Modern Realities and Globalization. Menstrual Products Addressing Period Poverty in Belize is being presented by Miriam Law. Miriam Law has a background in TESOL and special education with experience in community organization for an urban garden in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Her current work includes support for rural literacy. Originally from Malaysia, she now serves the community of Unitedville in the Kayu district, making books accessible by volunteering as library coordinator at St. Vincent Palotti RC School and maintaining the mile 59 bus stop library with the help of book donations. She joined Changelings Collective in 2022 a women's group specializing in sewing, washable diapers, and period pads, and now assists their efforts at promoting washable period products through pop-up appearances, online engagement, and is working to host more pad sewing sessions to encourage necessary conversation around menstruation. I present to you Ms. Ms. Miriam Long. everyone tuning in today. This presentation discusses how we can address period poverty through craft and conversation. 
Imagine being a child walking through tree trails that cut through the village, pretty tree line trails. Birds singing, little creatures scutter as you, away as you approach. Your steps are quiet, you're barefooted. You continue down the path, your bare feet pass rip up hot dog plastic, salchichas tins, a croco sack of soggy pampas. The dogs have ripped up bags, pirit pads are stashed about the path. Welcome to the modern world. Here, for convenience sake, everyday essentials come with so much associated packaging we have outproduced nature herself. Can you believe that there is now more human-created stuff in the world than there are land and sea creatures put together? Half of Belize lives in a poverty today that makes short-term purchasing choices that often comes with high waste output, a necessity that nevertheless has long-term compounding effects. Poverty aside, we also do embrace shiny new conveniences that maintain a disposable culture. What are the cost of a disposable lifestyle and how does poverty affect someone who periods? In other words, what does period poverty look like? These are some of the questions that motivated a group of women to start crafting washable diapers and later cloth period pads to provide affordable, quality, reusable product for, for Belizeans. Change Lanes Collective is a small group that engages society in conversation over how we can address unsightly dumping combat unhealthy burning of waste, reduce landfill buildup, choose future-friendly products, and make better financial decisions. Our presentation today is on how a small group like Changelings can help normalize period talk and take on period poverty in Belize through craft and conversation. Normalizing period talk is one step to break down the stigma sometimes associated with periods. Destigmatizing periods opens up the much needed conversation, research and documentation that can help tackle pollution, negative health effects and inequities around managing periods. Talk engages issues of water stability in rural areas, waste disposal, sewage costs, health and environmental impacts. Change in Collective is responding to the call agencies like UNICEF are making for greater community participation. Even though our craft addresses period poverty from a product point of view, which will not in itself change the stigma attached to it, the products can serve as conversation starters that help normalize talk around menstruation and other important issues, and steer talk away from arbitrary shame or silence. Stigma shattering is important because menstrual products with lower negative environmental impacts, such as washable pads, period underwear, the period cup, often fall under the radar of institutional policy and risk being ignored by a significant portion of the population. Those who might broach the subject can feel isolated, but people need to know about these reusable options to better combat period poverty. Period poverty describes a lack of access to education on periods, an absence of accessible hygiene facilities or unavailability of waste management related to menstrual products. The issues that surround period poverty and the dearth of access to essential period products and services are serious. Menstruating persons can face stigma and other emo negative emotions. This is so inconvenient! Hush, Anne! Keep your voice down. No one's supposed to know. A woman's cycle is a shameful thing. Unhealthy coping strategies such as eating and drinking less during the cycle have also been documented. Physical and mental health effects in daily life result because of poor facilities or ignorance about menstruation. And as the United Nations Population Fund's resource on menstruation and human rights declares, menstrual health issues are human rights issues and therefore important to society as a whole. This is why we work to talk about such a private matter such as periods. We argue as others have, as private a matter as it may seem, periods are also everyone's business. 64% of, of females here are at the age of menstruation, which amounts to 32% of the total population, majority located in rural locations. And since each menstruator can use up to 15,000 pads in their lifetime, this is a whole lot of garbage to deal with. In a nation of relatively tiny land area and sensitive ecosystems, this is significant. It matters where our waste goes and what we do with it. 
And on top of this, when it comes to conventional pad disposal, the current waste processing system in Belize is not future friendly. Conventional pads take the longest time to break down, 800 to 500 to 800 years due to being made up of 95% plastic. Just think of how that contributes to landfill expansion and waterway pollution. In rural areas, citizens cannot readily afford to pay for garbage disposal. Further enforcement of pollution regulations are lax and thus the norm is to burn, bush dump or even toss garbage into the rivers. Conversations with village residents reveal that systemic poverty is a major culprit for a continued negative practice of illegal trash disposal. And people are just trying to get by, and thus how can they be burdened with the greater concerns of pollution and long-term health? It is clear that the continued conversation, along with the discussion of alternatives, can bring about a posit positive outcomes. Interdisciplinary, multi-stakeholder collaborations can happen. If we can talk about the negative impacts on the ground, we can talk about them in the halls where policies are instituted and in both places introduce solutions. Conversations happen through our crafting product, our crafting and product engagement. People intrigued by the novelty of washable locally crafted menstrual product begin to engage about and talk about their health issues, their normal or abnormal period experiences, financial considerations they face, appraisal of, to of toilet designs for various products, and best practices for reusable things. Issues of waste management and other sanitation challenges. All this informal education occurs in conversation around a novelty or unconventional period product. In the question and answer section, we'd be interested to hear about your experiences and responses to period talk. Are you able to hold conversations on these topics as a menstruator or not? Or would you have to be careful about your audience? You might explore how patriarchal history, religion, or folklore contribute to stigma around these female experiences, but it takes more than just men to continue the silence around periods as well. Today, we are experiencing domino effects in environmental crisis linked to human rights issues, overlapping gender inequity issues. The subject of periods then is far from being dismissible, a dismissible issue for menstruators alone. Period poverty concerns energy flows, disposal costs, sewage maintenance, waterway pollution, and a widening disparity between the have and have nots, a whole network of interconnection to social factors. In high density nations like India or the Philippines, local industries have sprung up, making single use compostable pads from benign fiber, for instance. These industries engage people with periods and people without. But it happens only when conversations shift stigma or shame attached to periods towards caring solutions that help people period better. The brighter side of the modern world is that it is easier to connect, converse, and find spaces where discussion on topics like periods can happen. In these spaces, we can help ensure that the right thing to do, the right to do periods in dignified, accessible, safe ways is recognized while also addressing connections to potential pollution, clean water, pro clean water protection, and energy conservation. Founded by San Ignacio residents Stephanie Willis and writer-academic Dr. Virginia Hampton, Changin's Collective formed around a table of some seven people, mostly women. This Kayo group started off by sewing cloth diapers because a number of friends were having babies at the start of pandemic, where cost factor was becoming a clear problem. Virginia, who has a bachelor's degree in fashion design, steered the design and taught other members the sewing particulars. This collective was united in a desire to help social issues like reducing pollution and experiment with a collegial, non-hierarchical way of doing business. For myself and my spouse, we were motivated to do something to address the never-ending battle against diaper waste dumped around our village home. We aren't just talking the occasional plastic bag but crocus sack full of pampas dumped in the bush. The very day my friend called to ask me about sewing diapers, I was engaged in picking up diapers torn apart by dogs on the street. Because we had experience raising children on cloth diapers, this was not a new concept to venture into. Thus we moved from sewing diapers to sewing machine washable snap-on period pads because some friends also asked us to make them. We fed on the motivation 
to revive past practices for a sustainable future, to borrow from the words of Melinda Watson, writing on materials awareness. With the small but steady flow of requests, we decided on a theme to name the different pads. As the Macal River ran alongside town, where we sewed together, we came up with vessel names based on indigenous water vehicles, the canoa, the catamaran, the kayak, the contiki, and decided the kickboard to name the two-ply panty liner. From this brief one and a half year of sewing, distributing pads to our women in the, our village, and talking to people from across generations, mainly rural and urban parts of Cayo, we begin to see how multidimensional the topic around periods can be and the cascading effects of conversation around periods. Hosting our first sewing workshop in Belmopan under, the, under a council program was a great insight into the potential space for empowering women to open up about their health and financial choices. Aside from speaking with friends, acquaintances, and the general public, we reached out to some organizations to do general health, reproductive, and menstrual education to inquire about their interactions and expertise. We got a response from two of the three groups we approached. And what we gathered are, periods are not explicitly discussed outside of these formalizing discussions. Youth, if able to go to high school, are still missing up to one week per school of school per month because of periods. If youth don't get to go to high school, menstrual education is spotty and not updated. Education happens about language around periods and the biological nature, nature of menstruation, but less on issues like waste disposal, access to steady supply of clean water, or school, home, toilet infrastructure. Disposable pads are the standard, but adequate amounts, as ch changing when necessary, are not always affordable. The cup is slowly and steadily being promoted, but it is not as user-friendly for young menstruators. Other modern reusable options, such as the period underwear, is virtually unknown. So where do we see ourselves going from here? We want to move on to being a business that will also make available period underwear and through that sales be able to host workshops of pad sewing sessions, expanding space for craft and conversation. We aim to assist grassroots communities and collaborate with agencies to improve period education, specifically highlighting other modern options that can better improve financial, environmental and health choices. We want to improve visual recommendations and teaching materials that center around the management of reusable options and how simple toilet and bathroom design can improve period dignity. Such attentiveness complements already existing concerns about inclusive and proper infrastructure for persons with disabilities. We want to, after being more established, be able to source funding to provide aid in form of period underwear to target communities as we recognize simply addressing the inequities around how we period can help address some of the sustainable developmental goals the UN lists, namely good health and well-being, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, responsible consumption and production. Lastly, for now, we dream of looking into banana fiber as a resource, developing compostable single-use pads here, as this product is already in existence in other tropical countries. With Belize banana fiber having opened the doors to this resource, we see this possibility on the horizon. Belize is strategically located where other raw materials like hemp for alternative fibers and seaweed for bioplastic can work together to make modern period products that are independent of fluctuating fossil fuel prices. So we hope that if you ever find yourself in a conversation about periods, you'll be able to consider the wider context and help shift the conversation to a direction that empowers people. Thank you. All over the world, people who have periods are taking their power back. Your period is not their day, and you are not their day. No more shame, no more guilt, no more stink, and now, no more garbage. Now you can just wash it. Whether it's new school, like a period cup or period underwear, or old school, like washable pads, you've got options. All of them, ecolicious, innovative, cheap, and not smelly. You can just wash it. It's a small thing. Invest for yourself or someone else. Close the loop, up with the poverty demons, give up the synthetic funk. Just wash it.
Continuing with the theme, Modern Realities, is our next presenter, Dr. Krishke Deguer. Her presentation, titled Helping Professionals' Perceptions and Experiences with Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children in Belize, a response to the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Act of 2013, explores CSEC as a significant issue in Belize. Ms. Deguerre is a fourth-year PhD candidate at the University of Albany. Her research interests are gang-involved women, mental health, and trauma. Currently, she is a full-time criminal justice lecturer and counselor at Galen University. Prior to starting her doctorate, she worked as a mental health counselor in Belize with the Ministry of Human Development, where she worked with youth involved with gangs, or youth at risk of joining gangs. Recently, she completed her dissertation study entitled Trauma and Re Resiliency <laughs> in At-Risk Gang Associated or Previously Gang-Involved Young Women in Belize, Trauma-Informed Narrative Interviews, which has developed from the findings from her previous research study examining gang-involved women in Belize. Hello, everyone. And first, I just want to say that my name is Krista Deguerre, and I am excited to be a part of the Culture Symposium for a second time. And today I will be talking to you about helping professionals, perceptions and experiences of commercial sexual exploitation of children in Belize. So first we must ask ourselves, what is commercial sexual exploitation of children? The World Congress Against Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children defined CSEC as sexual abuse by the adult and remuneration in cash or kind to the child directly or to a third party such as parents, guardians, or other people. In these cases of CSEC, the child is treated as a sexual object and a commercial object. The definition encompasses um, situations such as child sex tourism and other forms of sex where a child engages in sexual activities to have their essential needs met, such as food, clothing, education, or shelter. This also includes instances where the sexual exploitation of a child is not stopped or reported by parents or guardians because of the benefits acquired from the perpetrator. So because the child is receiving money that the parents or guardians need or other resources, the parents and guardians do not act to stop this abuse. So we must examine the situation of CSCC in Belize. The government of Belize passed the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Prohibition Act in 2013. Including within, the, within this law were statutes to make sexual assault legislation independent of gender of the victim and criminalization of all forms of child sexual exploitation, which included child pornography. And this, with this law, it brought great promise and international recognition for reducing and eventually eliminating child sexual exploitation and trafficking. But nine years after its passing, what do we know about its impact and the current prevalence of exploitation and trafficking in Belize? Internationally, Belize has been labeled as a significant source and transit and destination country for all categories of individuals subjected to sex trafficking and forced labor, such as men, women, and children. The UN Special Report of 2019 on trafficking persons detailed that family members often facilitate sex trafficking of women and girls in Belize. And it's often, again, because of those benefits acquired by this interaction. So within Belize, um, there are three primary forms of commercial sexual exploitation of children. These include sex, child sex tourism, 
a child connecting with a pimp in an attempt to support themselves or their family, and children who are exploited by family members, again, for those essential needs such as food, shelter, and other items. In colloquial terms, um, two of these forms of CSEC were identified as hit me on the hip and the dollar wop. The hit me on the hip phenomenon is driven by organized crime within Belize. It includes the use of illegal sexual activity, the go-between or what is labeled as the pimp and the trafficking victim. The individual acting as the go-between approaches young girls, often targeted girls in school uniforms to recruit and entice them to become sex workers. The go-between then finds the clients or the buyers of the sexual activity, which includes tourists, and sends a message to the victim of who and when to meet the buyer. So we have the next term um, entitled Dalawap, and this originates from children providing sexual favors in exchange for fried chicken or exchange for food, shelter, and other necessities. The term, the term Dalawap comes from the popular fried chicken, which is sold by the shops for prices starting at a dollar. These are children who are un unable to rely on their caregivers or family for support and in turn, they turn to commercial sexual trade to provide for themselves. Families, often mothers, do not stop this prohibited sexual abuse in their household due to this income providing essential needs such as food and clothing. In Belize, the data indicates that most of the individuals involved in exploiting children are the children's family members. And research on child sex tourism conducted by Weber in 2018 examined tourist motives for traveling and their actions at their destination. Weber discovered an association between sex and travel, as well as risky sexual attitudes, particularly in the areas of the world that are advertised as having sun, sex, and sand. This creates particular issues within the Caribbean, although independence has been achieved, the Caribbean states and their tourism industry is still significantly dependent on foreign investors. The research found that this leaves the Caribbean with inadequate control over the country's development and resources. The author reports that CSEC is a large part of the infrastructure of sex tourism within the Caribbean, finding both children, adults working together within streets, nightclubs, and brothels. There are also black market um, websites to sell sex tours, which incorporate damage, cu damaging cultural stereotypes to en entice the potential sex tourist desires for power and control. So within my study, um, like was introduced at the beginning, we're looking at the perceptions of professionals working in Belize on CSEC. Um, and the participants in this project were four helping professionals working in different areas and sectors of Belize. The helping professionals included in this project were two social workers, a director of an NGO organization that specializes in legal services and a high school teacher. The goal was to gather diverse perspectives from professionals working in different capacities and different areas of the country. And these professionals were hypothesized to have some knowledge of CSEC, whether personal knowledge or professional knowledge, or even both. Participants were recruited through established professional connections and by convenience sampling. The interviews were conducted through Zoom due to the COVID-19 restrictions at the time and were from 45 minutes to an hour long, depending on the participants' availability. Um, the, there was an inductive thematic content analysis and that was conducted to identify common themes within the interviews, common topics, ideas, patterns that come up repeatedly. The themes identified within the data for this project um, reflect the helping professionals' perceptions and experiences with CSEC, including poverty, education, culture, governmental and legal failures, and significant trauma. 
So here on the screen, you can see um, a quote from one of these participants. And this is personal experiences with CSEC. Like I said, a content analysis was conducted on four semi-structured interviews and revealed significant experiences with CSEC by all helping professionals. Examining the personal experiences of a high school teacher reflected in this quote on the screen, also were who was also at the time working as a school counselor and worked for 15 years within a rural, rural district that is significantly affected by CSEC. She shared their response to the question, describe a significant memory or experience you have with witnessing CSEC or trafficking within your community. And again, the high school or the high school teacher's response is on your screen. This quote gives a clear example of how embedded CSEC and trafficking are within cultures where the mother was selling her daughters into sex trafficking. Of significance, this village is on the Guatemalan border, which is an active location for international trafficking and smuggling of all kinds. This also indicates a cultural value that contributes to CSEC the, and perpetuation of trafficking. The value of not involving oneself in someone else's affairs. This is a common theme within the interviews and spans many issues in Belize. This may be a value established due to the small size of Belize and consequences that are often faced due to sharing someone else's um, experiences. If one to if a person was to report something that they witnessed, their neighbor or community member doing it would it would not be difficult for them to find out who reported them and retaliation is a significant fear in this situation. Unexpectedly, this same participant describes having trauma responses associated with this memory when working with female students in the classroom. Trauma responses and experiences were replicated in the follow in all interviews and became a significant focal point of this analysis. Within this interview, the teacher describes bringing as much food as possible for her students to take home to try to eliminate the need to seek out CSEC for income related to food needs. Although the participant was not asked about trauma when this quote was analyzed, it was evident that a trauma response was expressed. And this interview data was an analyzed for trauma responses using the trauma symptom checklist 40 this participant expressed seven trauma symptoms within their interview. The symptoms expressed by this participant included headaches, feelings of isolation, anxiety or panic attacks, stomach problems, feelings of guilt, tense feelings, and sadness. So again, here I provide a quote under the idea of professional experiences with CSEC. This person was a veteran social worker working in the west of the country for 20 years. He expressed distress distressing trauma symptoms classified as behavioral and emotional symptoms when outlining his professional experiences with cases involving CSEC. The interviewer, me, posed a question and I probed the social worker to describe his professional experiences with CSEC. He responded with the quote here that you can read on the screen. This case's psychological impact on this long-term social worker is significant as the participant feels the need to continually to look for this girl to avoid disturbing thoughts and images about what may have happened to her. This is not only an example of secondary trauma, but PTSD as well. According to Figley 1999, trauma symptoms may cause significant disruption in functioning, which often leads to developing PTSD. This may be cause for concern as the participant is expressing behavioral actions associated with a trauma experience. This interview data, his um, interview was analyzed again for trauma symptoms, revealing seven specific trauma symptoms found in his interview, these feelings were insomnia, flashbacks, feelings of isolation, anxiety or panic attacks, nightmares, feelings of guilt, and tense feelings. 
So, you know, the participants were also asked to identify barriers to success of the CSEC 2013 law, in their opinion. And the third interview participant was a female director and founder of an NGO specializing in legal services. This NGO operates out of the north of Belize in Orange Walk District and has been operating for over 10 years. When asked about barriers in combating CSEC in Belize, this participant identified what she named as cultural level trauma. The idea of cultural trauma, cultural level of trauma causing barriers in fighting CSEC and trafficking within Belize has not yet been explored within the literature. This participant explained that she sees trauma and its effect on every level of society that, that is supposed to be protecting the children of Belize. The participant explains that trauma affects the parents, police, social workers, and government officials. And because of this, children remain unprotected from CSEC. This quote on the screen is significant as it highlights unreported barrier to progress, trauma. The idea presented by this participant is that trauma is affecting all levels of society, which cause delays, issues, and further setbacks to combating CSEC in Belize. The idea of cultural trauma is significant. Future research is needed to uncover and substantiate this phenomena in Belize and its relation to CSEC. This participant's interview was also analyzed for trauma symptoms and four trauma symptoms were found. The symptoms expressed included feelings of loneliness, trouble controlling anger, insomnia, guilt, and tense feelings. While this participant reported fewer emotional symptoms of trauma when compared to other participants, she described in greater detail how she sees trauma manifest culturally create and create a barrier for CSEC. The cultural and societal level of trauma was also highlighted within the interview of the male social worker who has been working in one of the most poverty stricken areas of Southside in Belize. This social worker expressed experiencing emotional symptoms of secondary trauma. These included feelings of overwhelm, hopelessness, feeling numb and defeated. The participant expresses feelings of hopelessness after being asked about the factors that contribute to CSEC. So what is cultural trauma? Cultural trauma occurs when members of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves marks upon their group consciousness, making their memories forever and marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental ways. Participants indicated a societal or cultural level of trauma contributing, contributing to a lack of progress in fighting CSEC in Belize. Like individual trauma, cultural trauma can result from many different hardships and experiences resulting in severe symptoms. The only difference is the scope of its effect. Cultural trauma impacts an entire culture than just the individual. Additional research indicates that historical or cultural trauma is significant and experienced by colonized nations. The authors of this research indicate that historical trauma can cause feelings of familial and social disruption, existential depression, chronic grief, that manifests in culturally destructive behaviors and re-experiencing colonial trauma through experiencing modern day racism. So the preliminary results from the content analysis, although this research did not initially hypothesize trauma as being a barrier for progress in eliminating CSEC in Belize, the interviews revealed that this was a significant factor in the perceptions of the participants and not only affects the individuals that are in the helping professionals, affects the entire system created to protect children.
Passive comments within the inter interviews identified feelings of hopelessness, that unless systematic changes occur to address cultural trauma, the cycle of CSEC and trafficking will continue. The idea of cultural level trauma causing barriers in fighting CSCC and trafficking within Belize has not yet fully been explored by the literature. Through this research, trauma was highlighted as a possible significant factor as a barrier to progress in fighting CSCC. Future research should seek to establish a connection between cultural individual and secondary trauma and how it relates to CSEC, trafficking and barriers for progress in protecting our children in Belize. Thank you for listening to my presentation today and I look forward to the discussion and questions soon. Thank you. Thank you for those insightful uh, data. Uh, thank you for that insightful data presented. I think there's a lot there to digest and to sit with. Next on our agenda, we're going to have Miss Abby Godoy presenting on modern realities and globalization with her presentation, Policing the Pandemic, a Case Study of Belize. Ms. Abby Godoy is from San Ignacio in the Cayo District. She is currently pursuing a Master of Philosophy in Social Anthropology as a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. Abby's areas of focus include violence, social suffering, activism, and youth. As such, she chose Belize as one of her primary field sites for her thesis, where she studied policing cultures in Belize, during COVID-19 and the subsequent waves of activism that followed. As a result of travel constraints due to COVID-19, this research project is a digital ethnography. My name is Abby Godoy. I am an Oxford graduate holding a Master's of Philosophy in Social Anthropology and today I will be presenting a section of my dissertation which I have abstracted and entitled Policing the Pandemic, a Case Study of Belize. Um, firstly, I would just like to say that my work is very lengthy and this presentation is very short. Um, the focus of my dissertation was policing police legitimacy and police histories in Belize and Nigeria. Um, for this presentation, I will only be talking about the case study I used in Belize, or one of the case studies I used for Belize. Um, and so I think it's really important to discuss why I chose to historicize the pandemic and why it is my point of departure. And so I believe that COVID-19 created a moment of exception. And I use the theory of Corona scene to describe the imbalance of political power created during this time. It is from this that I assert that the state of exception resulted in the deregulation of legitimate force as governing bodies and the branches that represent them observed extended powers during this time. So on a daily basis in normal times, um, the government and the police are concerned with preserving your rights and your safety. Um, but COVID-19 created a completely different realm where that became secondary and health and the biopolitical became the primary concern of the government and police. And that's what created a gray area for policing. So I had to create this entire ethnography from a digital landscape and point of view because I could not physically go back to police during COVID-19 and conduct the research that I wanted to. And so I think it's very important to note that one of the things that I propose is that the imbalance of political power was best observed virtually in what I call the global virtual spectacle of terror. And this refers to the way that we were experiencing the world during COVID-19 when we were isolating and our phone screens, our TV screens were the way that we saw the world. And this is how we began to witness state sanctioned violence. And a prime example of this is with George Floyd, where there was a global community of people all watching the same video 
where a man is killed in broad daylight by a police officer. And so that's kind of the background of COVID-19 and how people began to experience and witness state sanctioned violence, in my opinion. And so moving on to my case study, I would just like to say that I'm very passionate about social justice and picking this case was something very personal and I hope that I am able to shed light into some insights into this case that perhaps have not been explored on the media and through the um, news. Um, and so case study one that I used is Nadi Jilet. Um, I think it's also important to kind of mention some of my methodological work as it is very important and pertinent to how we conduct research in the post-COVID world. And so I began my ethnography with a imaginary vignette. Um, this just means that I set the scene for what Placencia Beach might have felt like on the night that Larry Gillette died. I of course was not there and so I do not claim that any of my vignette is true. I just thought it was a very interesting way to begin this chapter. And so I hope that many of you will know the case detail as I do not wish to linger on them describing the events of the night. Instead, I would like to focus on the points of exploration that I found were insightful from the case. And so, while my study was on COVID-19, the questions that were raised went beyond and pointed to more systematic issues in the histories of policing. And so the first question I asked myself when I saw the case was why would a whole unit be sent to investigate two young men? The proportion of officers present to suspects did not seem to have a definite correlation to me. I, of course, am not an officer and have no idea what the standard is, but I am studying legitimate force and policing, so I know what over policing looks and sounds like. And naturally, that is exactly what it felt like was happening. And I took to the news archives and I began to see a pattern. So while Larry Gillet made me think about the particular time period of COVID-19, it also led me to question what policing looked like in Placencia in the past. And I used News 5 articles, Channel 7, which are very good sources of archive work for this. And so what I saw was a pattern and I started to realize that Placencia, the peninsula itself, is one of the most over-policed areas of Belize, which is surprising as police are also only centralized in a little over a mile of road. Um, this is called spatial policing. And in order to understand why this might be an issue, you have to look at the surrounding geographical area. The peninsula has undergone immense development. And as I explored how the peninsula is marketed and sold for consumption to foreigners and the affluent, it becomes clear that there is an ongoing process to create and ensure social homogeneity. So I went into incognito mode and I began to research how someone from the outside might see Placencia. And the peninsula is obviously marketed as a very luxurious, type fantasy land playground for people with lots of money. And so this means that there are enclaves of affluent migrants and Belizean elite who have created a pattern of social segregation as the landscape of Placentia now articulates security, seclusion, and services. However, there is one problem, same bite a predominantly black community in a continuously gentrifying area of Belize. This means that the exclusionary contours of Placentia's elite has seen growing inequalities between the residents of St. Bite and the rest of the peninsula. This, of course, has created racial tensions. When you have a predominantly black community constantly conflated and described stereotypically as violent and problematic without any deeper exploration of the causes, it creates systemic ideas of social and physical disorder that legitimize aggressive police surveillance. The more we talk about St. Bite and certain areas of Placentia as problematic, the more it is over-policed and surveilled. 
And so going through the news archives and reading how the commissioner of police and other official media liaisons describe the violence and unrest in St. Bite, it points to a regime of robust policing that has taken place over the years without much exploration as to why. Um, this, of course, for me, opened up consideration for the production and reproduction of cultural racism by state actors. Simply, Placencia is idealized as a place of order and safety for its white residents, while police in this area are aggressively proactive when dealing with residents of color, and this proactiveness is celebrated, which is a whole other can of worms, but I just think it's really important to make that note. This ideal encompasses the race and place effect, which posits that close proximity to perceived white domains make people of color more susceptible to increased police scrutiny than those in predominantly black locations. <sighs> to return to the case of Lottie Gillette, it is evident that law enforcement in Placencia, backed by private security, is waging a war against black residents, as their actions highlight the capacity for unregulated violence against those racially categorized as threatening. Again, how would the situation been different had it been two white residents socializing on the beach that night. Looking at the Human Rights Committee's report for 2021, it is, clearly, it is clear justifiable force in Belize's regulations is very subjective and in a time of exception can lead to the extension of police powers beyond that which we normally regulate. Um, these instances of police brutality in Belize have no civilian oversight body. I find this important to note as internal investigations of these crimes have created a legacy of abuse. <sighs> so simply put, in a country where there is already so much gray area into police legitimacy and police force and when it is justifiable force, COVID-19 created a new world for this. And there is really no way of knowing who is accountable and how this accounting process takes place without the civilian interest in cases, which I think that many people touch on on social media as I observed. And so I would like to kind of segue into what the methodology to this case was. And so using digital media, I followed the circulations, reimagining. magnification, deletion, translation, revision, and remaking of a range of cultural representations, experiences, and identities of state-sanctioned violence throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this kind of ethnography is patchwork ethnography, and I am part of a generation of anthropologists who were not able to do the traditional forms of ethnography, and so patchwork ethnography kind of refers to the way that we take methodologies from one kind of um, tradition and kind of put that into the digital space. And so I was very lucky in the fact that the COVID-19 cases of police brutality were encapsulated and frozen in time as I would be able to go back into the comment sections, into group chats and just kind of read off what people were saying and kind of still preserve the rawness of what was happening at the time. And so my thesis was littered with screenshots, statistics for hashtags and the explanation of metadata properties. I looked at online communities that became offline to understand how the digital and analog forms of engagement are mutually constituted. So one of the most important things that I learned throughout this entire process was that there is so much rich information digitally to capture what is going on during COVID-19. But most importantly, there seems to be very evident lack of questioning as to why certain areas are over-policed in Belize, when it seems that if you just take one step further back and look at the whole picture, it becomes quite evident that there is something major like social segregation and racial tension and just the way that bodies are treated during COVID-19 were completely different to any other time 
And so being mindful at the time, I think I'm just going to stop right there. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who took the time to listen. I know it's been very short, but I would love to discuss this further if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Ms. Godoy. And certainly I must say that they were very informative and very insightful, uh, the, the past two presentations. It has also definitely brought back a lot of memories for us as Belizeans, a lot of some of that cultural and collective trauma that has been mentioned. And so it, it definitely has been quite a heavy session so far. And so as we move on, I invite you to uh, absolutely, as you think over uh, these presentations, please uh, drop your comments in the, in the chat and where necessary, um, where uh, some of our viewers are um, reaching out to us as an organization, uh, we will direct you as necessary towards the resources that are needed. Um, so it definitely has been a very heavy uh, afternoon session, but as well, though heavy, though raw, these are the conversations that we need to have if we are going to move forward and improve and better our communities and our cultural life. So as we move on, we are going to wrap our first session today. Uh, this first session, we have another session coming up. So we're going to wrap this session with a presentation from Mr. Bronwyn Foreman, who will be presenting Rhythm and Algorithm, Insights on the Relationship Between Big Tech and Our Data. Bronwyn Foreman holds a master's degree in English with a concentration in multicultural and transnational literatures from East Carolina University. While Mr. Foreman's initial interest in the study of multicultural literatures endures, as of late, he is more preoccupied with the study of digital rhetoric. Mr. Foreman has lectured at East Carolina University, Sacred Heart Junior College, and is now a member of faculty at the University of Belize. He intends to continue his work in education, teaching, researching, and meaningfully contributing to his community. I present to you, Mr. Bronwyn Foreman. About big tech and our data. In a world of heightened digital connectivity, Massive tech corporations are ever in search of new ways to shape humanity. Cyberspace is no longer just a digital underground for crackers, hackers, and the like. It is a space built for and fueled by human consciousness. We are the citizen users in big tech's net states, willingly entrusting our rhythms to their algorithms. But are we aware of the price we pay to play? So who are the leading big tech companies? While there are more equally formidable corporations, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, and Meta embody the pinnacle of modern day tech dominance. Scott Galloway in his book, The Four, describes Amazon as Earth's biggest store with a network that doubles several of its retail competitors combined. Apple, he writes, found great success filling two instinctual needs, to feel closer to God and to be attractive to the opposite sex. In the process, Apple claimed a place among the world's most profitable companies. Facebook amassed a following of 1.2 billion people and monopolized one of every six minutes spent online. And Alphabet is the modern man's god our source of knowledge, harnessing the power of 2 billion people 24 hours a day and yielding a whole infinitely greater than the sum of its parts. In real life, big tech is responsible for thousands of jobs, putting food on the table for thousands of families. 
Beyond the jobs they provide, their products and services have become the cornerstone of entertainment, commerce and productivity. The email services we use, the search engines we rely on, the social media platforms we engage, the streams we consume are all yields from big tech corps. One way or the other, we're all plugged into big tech and big tech plugged into us. And so it would be against the spirit of innovation not to point out that big tech accomplished and continues to accomplish great things. Over the years, big tech ushered in a slew of mass magical tech moments, introducing new products and services that continue to shape how we function as professionals and as social beings. Even the current impetus that underlies the mission and vision of development in nation states like Belize is tech driven. And one would argue exists by and large because of big tech's innovation in more developed nation states. All this I point out to assure you that this is not a treatise about leaving cyberspace. Even if we don't love it, it's probably too late to leave it. And so what this is, is a sober look at the relationship we as citizen users share with net states. Is that price of admission we pay to connect, to produce, to socialize, to shop, to learn, to consume, fear? Or are we once again pitted against a force who designed the interplay between our rhythms and their algorithms in a way that always affords them the upper hand? Before we explore the cost of admission, let's explore why big tech is now being referred to as net states. The term net state was coined in 2017 by public servant, teacher and writer Alexis Wachowski. In her book, The Information Trade, she outlines four qualities shared among modern day net states. One, net states have international reach. Two, their core work is based on technology. Three, their pursuits are influenced by beliefs, not just the bottom line. And four, they expand into areas formerly the domain of governments areas outside their primary products and services. Amazon, Apple, Meta and Alphabet all tick those boxes. In fact, the first two criteria for Wachowski's net state status is clearly exemplified in the wealth accrued from the global magnitude of their reach and mastery over their core technological work. Collectively, these big tech corps were worth 2.3 trillion US dollars in 2017. But those figures are pre-COVID. According to Forbes, more recent 2022 figures indicate that the Four Horsemen's collective worth almost tripled to 6.4 trillion US dollars. Now what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that big tech companies, at least from an economic perspective, have market capitalizations that rival the GDP of many nation states. And not just small ones, but the major players. When it comes to Wachowski's third criteria, that their pursuits are influenced by beliefs, when last have you heard Zuckerberg speak? I'm here to tell you that finding your purpose isn't enough. The challenge for our generation is to create a world where everyone has a sense of purpose. These founders were and are highly convicted leaders out to do nothing short of shaping human consciousness and by extension human existence. While I would argue that capital still remains king for net states, the ideologies that underlie their operational models are the forces that keep us firmly wired in. One would stand to reason that any encroachment into the domain of the world's leading nation states must be an undertaking backed by colossal amounts of zeal, the very sort imbued in Facebook's founding motto, move fast and break things. Big tech are no longer in just the business of carrying out their core tech services, but they are involved in much more. They are in the business of rivaling not just the wealth of nation states, but the functions of nation states. A commonality among all four companies is that the citizen user, or more specifically control over the citizen user's data, is key. Data is the lifeblood that keeps your heart pumping. It is the pixels needed to accomplish what's simultaneously one of the most awe-inspiring and also, potentially, one of the most dangerous human feats. 
And that feat is acquiring the most complete portrait of the human psyche that ever existed. Franklin Foyer, in his book, World Without Mind, points out that a portrait of a psyche is a powerful thing. It allows companies to predict our behavior and anticipate our wants. With data, it is possible to know where you will be tomorrow within 20 meters. Do you realize that if it is possible to know where you'll be, it is also possible to know what you're thinking? In itself, Big Tech's quest for what would seem to be near clairvoyant abilities is not nefarious. From as far back as ancient philosophy to modern day psychology, humans occupy themselves with decrypting the human psyche. The problem is Big Tech's godlike view of the marketplace. Lecturer at the City University of London, Cecilia Rickap, in her book, Capitalism, Power and Innovation, believes that leading big tech corporations of the 21st century are intellectual monopolies. They rely on a permanent and expanding monopoly over portions of society's knowledge. Harvard professor Shoshana Zuboff explains that one of the main tactics used to feed the monopoly is surveillance capitalism where Big Tech unilaterally claims human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. And so, it's not just that they can predict an exact, decisive influence on citizen users, but they do so unilaterally. This is the problem. And the ideology that underlies this problem is one that the world is all too familiar with. It is an old colonial problem that is now a neo-colonial problem that is best described as a digital colonial problem. In the past, empires expanded their power through the control of critical assets, from trade routes to precious metals. Today, it is not states but technology empires that dominate the world through the control of critical digital infrastructures, data, and the ownership of computational power explains lawyer and digital rights activist Renata Avila Pinto. Professor Michael Quet, visiting fellow at Yale's Information Society project, describes the issue as follows. Colonial conquest typically entails dispossession of valuable resources from the native peoples and ownership and control of critical infrastructure by colonial powers which facilitates foreign control. On the digital colonialism, foreign powers are planting infrastructure in the global south engineered for its own needs, enabling economic and cultural domination while imposing privatized forms of governance. Quet, Pinto, Wachowski, Zuboff, Galloway, Rickup, and many other digital rights activists have already started the conversation. Their works widen the scope of post-colonial inquiry, putting into focus big tech, their net states, and the predatory nature of their business models. What's at stake here is agency. Europe and its imperial campaigns once seized agency and dominion over many peoples and cultures they had no right to. They made translations from human to beast, from free human to slave, when they had no right to. A hunger for capital gain and a god complex sure can do things. In this digital age, big tech armed with a similar hunger for capital gain and the God complex has wrested control of our data, and it is not forcible, they made us willing accomplices in our own exploitation. How many of us read the terms of service agreements before we download that free Play Store app, or register for that new Gmail email account, or link WhatsApp to our Sims, or make that purchase on Amazon? These TOS agreements are on average about 6,000 words long. Most people don't. But it is those TOS agreements that Big Tech uses to safeguard itself from any liabilities surrounding the collection, use, and sale of our data for purposes outside of improving citizen user service. If you want people to ignore you, be detailed. Write it down. Big Tech, like the capital it craves, is vampire-like and lives only by sucking more data, and lives the more the more data it sucks. Make no mistake, the price we pay to play in big tech's net states is high. When we use our favorite apps and services and agree to those TOS agreements, 
we willingly grant access to our digital footprints, including our most private conversations. Apps like Facebook not only collect citizen user data on their platforms, but also collect data from entirely unrelated activities on our devices. This is how they have mastered the art of the personalized suggestions. And if you find it unsettling that your device and all its contents are fair game for data mining, then it should be doubly off-putting when you consider that our data is peddled from company to company like fresh produce. What do you think Google does with the 3.5 billion queries it receives per day? Market them to companies like Amazon, of course. Even our deleted profiles and content, while inaccessible to us, live on in NetState's data banks. All this and our government, most governments, are near powerless to curb NetState's and their data mining practices. NetState's exact a similar treatment to nation states as they do citizen users. Take Trinidad for instance. They are up in arms because 60% of the bandwidth flowing through their national internet service provider is monopolized by three companies. Their ISP foots the bill to service the pipelines while big tech handsomely profits without proportionally giving back to the country. And this happens because net states, especially in smaller nation states like Belize, operate with impunity. If even we were to have a grievance about a perceived breach of privacy or other perceived injustices, where would we seek redress when net states conveniently operate outside the jurisdiction of most nation states? Yes, it is true that we have at our fingertips the cutting edge of innovation. But it is also true that we are the innovation. We have been commodified, and with every click, swipe, and keystroke, we maintain big tech's flexible positional superiority. With an infinite supply of citizen user data, used to amass an almost infinite supply of capital and influence, what really, if anything, can we do? If the very nation states that birthed the world's largest net states are struggling to regulate digital colonial practices and safeguard user data, then where does this situate smaller nation states like Belize? On one end, we're empowered by being plugged in, but on the other end, we're disempowered by the very tools and platforms we've so come to love. Should we just throw our arms up in resignation at the resource-heavy, tech-savvy Leviathans and do nothing? or? Are there pragmatic moves that can be made to establish more fair citizen user rights in the future? And so, a viable way forward for us in Belize is the expansion of our foreign ministry's portfolio to include diplomacy. Denmark was the first country to take this bold step in 2017. Their tech embassy seeks to dismantle the inequity inherent in the relationship between citizen users and net states prioritizing the concept of reciprocation. They have advisors who work closely with net states to learn about new tech developments and use that information to further national growth. They have policy developers who work closely with net states to learn their methods and use that information to develop policy protections at home for citizen users. They even have personnel tasked with bringing foreign investment home by spotlighting their country's efforts in seeking more equitable citizen user rights. Are you seeing the picture of what a similar mechanism can afford Belize and many other smaller nation states? We would be joining fellow nation states in pressuring big tech and their net states to work more symbiotically rather than parasitically. On a citizen user level, another viable way forward is to continue raising awareness. We need to raise generations to understand what it means to be citizen users, to understand that cyberspace comes with both rights and responsibilities. This way, we will have young people that are more critically inclined to make informed choices online that are to a lesser degree influenced by big tech stealth mechanisms. Also, awareness of big tech colonial practices can help us as a people to safeguard ourselves from similar injustices from our own local tech companies. This is a story about us and our data. This is also a story about big tech 
Anoy Tito. Thank you, fellow citizen user, for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. We will now bring our presenters on screen for our question and answer period. We will have approximately 15 minutes for this question and answer period before we move on. All righty. Okay, so we have our presenters online live now. Thank you for those uh, presentations and so lovely to have you here. We'll start uh, from the top with questions for Miss Miriam Law. And one of our first questions is, what do you think is the cultural issue with being uncomfortable with period talk? Are we getting better about having the conversation? I think we're having some trouble with our uh, technology. I cannot Should we? Hi, everybody. Hi, Miriam. Um, if you could leave the stream yard and reconnect, and then I'll add you back. Okay. While we wait for Miss Miriam to return to the screen, Please feel free to drop your questions uh, into the chat and we will answer these questions. So for all the presentations we've had so far this afternoon, you can ask any questions pertaining to any of those presentations. And uh, let's move on to uh, Ms. Daguerre and we'll take the first question for you. How do you even begin to approach such a sensitive matter? And this is pertaining to the presentation on uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children. Yeah, this is a question I've been thinking about since I saw it pop up. So thank you for asking it, April. I think it boils down to when we talk about trauma, we are able to heal our trauma. Um, so just continuing these conversations that I know Heritage has been having in all the platforms available to us, um, which can include public awareness campaigns to just um, normalize the idea of talking about these um, these things that happen in in the secret, in secret, in 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 families, in our communities that oftentimes people do not want to talk about. So just continuing to have these conversations and embrace the idea is when we speak trauma, we heal trauma. Thank you for that response, Krishka. I think that it is very comforting because we, we do want to be heard and we do need to be heard. Our next question is, how do we combat this taboo and the ethos of minding one's business when it means to protecting future generations? So I think it goes to what I just said as well of speaking to trauma, um, but also we need multi level interventions, awareness campaigns that, you know, this is an issue in Belize. When I speak to the general public, oftentimes people aren't aware this is happening. So bringing awareness to this specific issue and trying to get in touch with this idea of it takes a community, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, so speaking up for that child is is a part of raising that child, as well as continuing the conversations around this idea of we need to heal this cultural level trauma that we've experienced in Belize and whatever that looks like, giving space to those conversations is so important. Thank you for that response. 
do we have any other questions? And uh, let's see. I think we can move back to Miss Law since she's back in the in the stream yard. So let's go back to that question. And what do you think is the cultural issue with being uncomfortable with period talk? Or do you think we're getting better about having that conversation? Hi, good afternoon. Um, the second part of the question, I do think we are. Um, we do notice there might be some correlation of where we are within the Cayo district, that people are more willing to talk about menstruation. And um, and there are other areas where it's just, they have literally just turned their heads, giggled and walked away. Um, but generally, I mean, I think we're so, we've been so encouraged to continue this, although it started out from a passion project, you know, as mentioned earlier, to pursue this further, it's because of the somewhat surprising reactions we've gotten from from the general audience and the support on how important it is that the people do want to talk about it. A cultural issue, um, if we think of just the logistics of doing periods before piped water, before piped in water, and in relation to religious texts that would have references to menstruation, whether it's um, whether it's in different religions, you know, I grew up in Malaysia with Islam, um, with with Christianity and Bible and all those references, and some readings about even folklore and maybe perhaps even misinterpretations of the feminine identity that tie in with cultural narratives where periods have to do with a type of punishment and sin. So I think all that just for as far as we can go back to thousands of years and we, we're, I think we're still dealing with that. So, but with with more education, with social media, with the acceptance of there's um, of sharing so many different ideas, we are welcoming the talk about it. You know, it's just generally are we, we there's less censorship in many areas. So, it in in a, in a positive light, we're also being able to talk about periods and doing that. That's that's great. And on that talk about uh, the the reusable period pads, how do you identify the materials that you use for the reusable pads and diapers? And do you find them to be accessible and affordable? Uh, this this is our question from the, from the chat. And I think yeah, affordable and available here in Belize. That was a, that was a huge thing. Um, we we have. We've looked at different materials in physical form to see what is what is available here and what would wash easily, dry easily, so that you can properly and safely use it. I think not all materials are equal. So we've gone through different types of even natural fibers and cottons, and some of the weaving is better than others. Um, and they, yeah, there are, um, sorry, I forgot. They are also other, you know, synthetic fibers, which which are available or beeswax. So we physically tried that on and, and seen what is available here and that are affordable. So actually it's surprising there are. And we, that's what we, we found ourselves in this group to be a stepping stone to have that conversation of where can you find these things? Whether it's in Belize City, always Spanish Lookout, whether you find it one of those barrel sales that bring down really high quality cotton that we can buy new that are available in your um in like Kayo district for example and right down in San Ignacio town so it's surprisingly around us we just have to know how to see design and with youtube and open sources we've also learned a lot from that and then speaking to people who have how they they wash and use reusable things for example, you know, the ironing, the boiling and talk and trying to insert modern ways and modern snaps to make pads more easily manageable. Thank you. We have one more question in terms of cultural beliefs. How do you think we go about helping those in different cultures, uh, especially those that don't think it's important to talk about menstruation? Well, this is where this, the novelty products, you know, so the modern products like the period underwear and the cup 
um, that when people look at it, they have no clue what, it, what it's about and they, they, they start talking about it. And of course, when they look at a pretty, very, very, I think they're attractive. I think a lot of people said the pads have been very, are very attractive. When they look at this novelty product, they start to open up about the other conversations around just the doing periods. But that's where it's like, oh, you know, if we can have nice underwear, why can't we have pretty looking pads as well? Or what is this period um, panty about? And start talking about, well, do I have enough running water in my home? Am I still dealing with sanitation issues? So this is a, this whole pro product and the conversation where, yes, it's product based, but it helps people engage and then become curious and they want to talk about it. So we're finding that just by the product itself, it has actually engaged maybe people who are not very familiar or just won't ever talk about it. Okay, that's that's Sorry. that's great and positive news that we are having these conversations uh, that are so important and valuable for our society. Thank you, Miriam, for your responses. Our next question is directed to Miss Abby Godoy, and the question reads: Is this a kind of police colonial policing brought about by the majority non-Belizean investment or development? And if so, how can this be worked on? Um, certainly, I think that police in general are probably one of the most active longstanding pieces of colonial legacies. And many scholars will agree that the police are backed by Western states these days. And so they have a special investment in how we are policed. And in Belize and other colonial states such as Nigeria, we see that there is a want for violence. and. For example, when we talk about this investment, if we so my project looked at Belize and Nigeria, so I'm going to use an example from Nigeria, where the UK is a non-gun gun state, their police do not carry guns, yet the UK was brought out during SARS's investigation as being one of the people who gave them guns. And if you don't know what SARS is, SARS is the anti-robbery squad in Nigeria, and they had many scandals for like just being extremely brutal and horrible police. And um, they were basically funded by the UK, all of these weapons, and then went ahead and had a mass shooting during COVID-19 during a protest. They were basically Antarctica. funded by the UK, all of these and weapons, and then went ahead and had a mass shooting during COVID-19 during a protest. They were basically funded by the UK, all of these weapons. I'm hearing an echo and I'm not sure if that's happening all the time. <laughs> Um, I hope that answers the question. And the yes. way that we work on it, um, I think that depends on what your viewpoint is. If you're an extreme abolitionist, then you would think that let's just take down the police. We don't need the police. Um, I tend to lean more towards policing by consent and working on community policing and how the legitimacy of our police is sustained through our own want for them and what we think is reasonable actions for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that response. We also have another question for you. How do the responses to over-policing during COVID in Belize fit in with international protests against over-policing of black and brown communities across the globe? I think that that was the whole beautifulness of the moment is that watching how George Floyd became NSARS, how NSARS became NGSU, how all of these things were interconnected was definitely one of my focuses when I was looking more at the activist part of the present of my work. And so I think that it's really saying that COVID-19 opened up a virtual space where the participatory architecture of activism changed. It was no longer these single communities and single countries fighting this one fight. It was all of these people adopting new ways of protesting and it started off virtually, but in almost all of these cases, they eventually led to very physical altercations with the police. And so I think that that's kind of what it was. It was saying that in other times when you would have read a news story about an anti-police protest, you would have been like, oh, this is just happening somewhere else. But during COVID-19, it was especially evident that it was happening everywhere all at once and that everyone was experiencing the same things. And it kind of speaks to the post-truth era where we're no longer too much concerned with the fact of the matter. It becomes something of what people feel and how they're experiencing these things. And in COVID-19, the uncertainty that everyone was feeling kind of was what was creating and causing these protests to boil over, if that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, definitely brings a lot of insight. The next question is directed to a 
Mr. Bronwyn Foreman, and it reads, can you give us a hypothesis of how rhythm and algorithm can potentially change our connection to traditional knowledge and practices? Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if I will address the question the way that you intended, Ms. April, but I want to focus on practices now. And I noticed that in Mrs. Law's presentation, she mentioned that policy was very, very important in order to stem the tide or to shift things. And that's what I think is also important for us here in Belize, you know, advocacy in order to change policies that would benefit citizen users and not just the United States. Um, think about a country like Trinidad, as I mentioned, you know, 60% of the data and bandwidth that flows through their ISP is clogged up and is taken over by big tech companies. I mean, that in itself is a travesty when you think about big tech profiting and not giving anything in return to these countries. Now, a response to that is what Denmark did. You know, they created this tech diplomacy or this tech industry, or tech ambassador, and that ambassador liaises with these tech companies in order to find ways of how they can reciprocate, you know, ways of how they can give back to these countries. And that's something that I, I would hope can change in our country. And I also hope that we as citizen users could see what's at stake here, because we use these apps and we allow the internet of things to happen. You see, when Jobs pulled out that cell phone in 2007, and he said, you know, this is a smart device, right? That really shaped human experience. You know, that in itself was one of those mass magical tech moments. That led to what we see today, where people or companies take chips and put on your, I don't know, your washing machine. They put them on our refrigerators, and magically they're smart devices. What we don't understand is these devices are listening to us. Right? And they're not just listening in order to gather data to better their services, but they're listening to look at our entire digital footprint. So when you accept one of these terms of service agreements on your phones, right, it's not just tapping into what you're doing on Facebook. It's tapping into what you're doing on all apps on your entire device. right? And if the policies are done right, Right? If this diplomacy thing gets off the ground, then we are able to establish citizen user rights. Right? They are the controllers of the net states. Then we are able to determine the rights that we have. We already know that going online comes with responsibilities, but we need to know our rights. The very same way there is a universal declaration of human rights, we need a universal declaration of citizen user rights. And these rights are very simple. It doesn't have to be the 6,000 word um, terms of service agreement, but it could be one, citizen users have the right to choose how we pay, right? So if you want to use something, one of these apps, I think it's fair, it's their intellectual property, you must pay, but you get to choose if you want to use your currency or if you want to use your data. I feel like that's taking some control. Two, you get to choose whether or not you have the right to keep your data permanently deleted, right? That's one of the issues we have. When we delete our data off these platforms, we might not have access, but that data lives on in their data banks. And three, of course, the, the right to know how our data is used, right? I think policy to enshrine these things needs to happen, and I think it would be a fool's mission to, to put Belize up and say, well, Belize must get this done. No, I'm saying that we need to collaborate with the other partners, the other countries that understand the importance of working along with these big tech companies, not to demonize them, but to look at them and say, this relationship is unfair, right? How can we make this relationship that we have more fair? So um, in terms of my hypothesis, as you asked, Ms. Martinez, of how you know some change can be inspired, I hope our policymakers are listening, listening in and can make a move towards this change. And one final word here, no? If you looked at that interview that Zuckerberg had in, I think, 2018 or 2019 about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, when he was asked by one of the senators, how do you make money off Facebook? You know, I think the, the world chuckled, 
right? And for me, it showed that there is a disconnect between, you know, what these companies can do, the brilliance and the ingenuity that they bring to the table and how they operate, and the policymakers, right? The policymakers are not up to par with how these companies are operating. That's why they operate with impunity. So that's my response, no? Thank you, Mr. Foreman. So we have uh, so much, so much lovely input, but only such a limited amount of time. And also, we have here uh, Dr. Hampton, who came in uh, along with um, Miss Miriam Law. Uh, Miss uh, Dr. Hampton, do you have any anything you'd like to share? Um, just. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I think, okay, thank you. I think Ms. Lowe did it all. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I, I hate to say that we have to wrap up this question and answer session, but definitely that does not mean that the conversation ends here. The conversation continues and all of our viewers are taking uh, all of this material, all of this knowledge and continuing that conversation, I am sure, in our day-to-day -day lives in our household. So thank you very much, um, Ms. Miriam Law, Ms. Abir Godoy, uh, Ms. Daguerre, and Mr. Foreman for bringing mm -hmm. these very important issues to the forefront. Thank you. We will now move on to our coffee break. We will take a 15 15 minute coffee break. So to get that coffee to get back in there and continue with our second segment for the afternoon. So if you're, and, and I don't think you are, but if you feel that the afternoon blues are kicking in, up with language, culture, heritage, and the arts from October 5th to the 7th. Make sure you're the day. All we know that you are the day. Were you on the October 5th to the 7th? Heritage Education Network Belize Culture Symposium Community Issues and Innovative Practices. Make sure you join with our Facebook and YouTube. I want the day. You better the day.
right, so we're back. We are almost at the end of day two of our culture symposium hosted by Heritage Education Network Belize. And our theme for this final session this afternoon is embracing resilience and diversity. Human beings have been one of the most adaptable, resilient creatures on earth. We have been able to manipulate our environment in order to survive, and there has never been just one way to achieve this. Our heritage, an observation of our surroundings, plays a key role in our resilience and diversity. This afternoon's presentation lineup embodies these theme and much more. Our presentation, uh, this first presentation that we will have, was one where uh, culture was seen last year. And it is titled, Promoting, Protecting, and Preserving the Endangered Garifuna Language. It is being presented by Ms. Eleanor Castillo-Bullock. Ms. Castillo Bullock was born in Dangriga, Belize, and raised in the USA. She lived and attended school in St. Albans, Queens, New York, and attended and graduated from Syracuse University with a major in visual and performing arts. Eleanor uses her training in VPA to teach and train primarily Garifuna children, youth, and young adults the Garifuna language music and dance in an effort to promote, protect, and preserve our Garifuna culture, and particularly the Garifuna language, which is endangered and facing extinction. Eleanor feels compelled to give back what she knows, including her gifts and talent, and to teach the Garifuna language that she knows, and by the grace of God, that she can still speak to our Garifuna community here in Belize, and particularly to our Garifuna children, youth, and young adults, because they need to learn uh, the language. Uh, we will move on with our presentation by Miss Eleanor Castillo Bullock. Hello, my name is Eleanor Bullock, Castillo Bullock. My organization is Game International. I am producing this um, um, video for the organization Heritage Education Network of Belize. This um, video is for their 2022 Culture Symposium. Um, again, my name is Eleanor Castillo Bullock. My organization is Game International Inc. Game actually is a Garifuna word that stands for Game Wamali. Game, the A in Game stands for Garifuna Arts. The M in Game stands for Garifuna Medicine. The A in Game stands for Garifuna Agriculture. And the E in Game stands for Garifuna Education. Game is actually was actually created to resolve the inquiry and the question about where are the 1950 to the 1970 Garifuna children of Dangriga Belize? Well, the answer to that is Game International Inc. has been created to answer that inquiry. And the answer to the question, so what are they doing now? those Garifuna from Dangriga from the 1950 and 1970 that traveled to America, that migrated to America? Well, again, Game International is the answer to that. Game was created to become a leading organization in the United States, particular New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. It is an instrument and the tool that has brought together a few of us Garifuna from Southern Belize to work on, participate, and create projects and programs on a national, international, and global level. This is to help the Garifuna crisis, which is plenty, including poverty, disease, unemployment, and most important, language loss. That's major in our community today. And that's just to name a few. 
Game has been created to show God and to show our ancestors that as long as we are alive today, Garifuna is going to be alive. And we also, through Game, are looking to tackle, to confront, and face our major Garifuna crisis head on to become change agents and to make a change. Game, well, which I said was most of us that are from Southern Belize, we are here to help keep Garifuna alive and to keep the culture and the language alive. Our mission and foremost is to uphold, uplift, promote, protect, preserve the Garifuna heritage, the Garifuna language, the Garifuna culture, and our Garifuna spirituality. As one of the leaders, and I have been called an elder, I have taken the opportunity to use my God-given skills and God-given um, creativity and my talent to, to pass it on to our younger generation. We are looking to them to help preserve, protect, uphold, and safeguard our Garifuna language and our culture. It is my effort to promote the safeguarding of the Garifuna heritage and language as the director of the Game Arts Division. In 2005, I co-created myself and Mr. James Lavelle. We, co we created the Habinaha Garinagu Garifuna Language Performing Arts Program, which is known today as the Habinaha Program. It is a workshop type of program, and it is designed to desynthesize, to synthesize, teach, and to pass on uh, the language, the knowledge, our Garifuna traditions, our customs, and the values of our intangible Garifuna culture and heritage to children, youth, and young adults. And we do this through traditional Garifuna music, songs, dance. I added drama, Garifuna drama. We have storytelling. We do our spirituality. We, uh, we exhibit that, and um, which is our spirituality, which, which binds us together as a community. It is very important to, to have that in our program to show our cultural and, of course, our individuality, individual identity, and, of course, to preserve and conserve the indigenous Garifuna heritage and our language. As I mentioned in the Habinaha Garinago program, it is the intangible Garifuna heritage of music, songs, poems, and dance that we teach the, in, in the program. This is to um, teach our traditional customs or traditional values, sometimes even some of our, our traditional ethics. And we do that by teaching children ages five to maybe six to about 18. And to those who, of course, who are interested in the Habinaha program, it is very effective because of the lyrics of the song. We transpose the Garifuna lyrics into English and we use both English and the Garifuna in our program. And we do this so that the person participants themselves can know what they're saying and what they're performing and know what they're doing in drama or whatever it is that they're doing on the stage. And we also do the transposing of the Garifuna and the English for our audience because we need our audience to also know what they are hearing in our presentations. I promote the Garifuna culture by telling Anybody and everybody who I meet, especially if I meet them for the first time, who I am and where we come from. I love to do that, and I take a pleasure in telling people about our Garifuna history, our Garifuna heritage, and our spirituality and our culture, because in most cases, they've never even heard of Garifuna. Sometimes they, very few of them is even still have heard of Belize. 
But when you tell them Garifuna, they're like, Gary, what? Gary, what? So I love when I tell the story, uh, our story of who we are, about the Caribs and where we come from, and of course, about the language that we speak. Sometimes they ask me um, to say something in Garifuna, and they're usually really surprised to hear um, um, when I speak Garifuna. So I'll, I'll say something like, Kasabiri, what is your name? Or I'll say Kasa uh, Ora or Halia Ge de Busa. Where are you? Where are you going? Where are you coming from? I would I would say to them, and of course they will be taken back to hear the language. In most cases, they've never heard the language before. So again, as the uh, director in the Game Arts Division, I am here to promote the. Habinaha Garinogu program, which is again a, a, a workshop like program that introduced to children, youth, and young adults ages six to about 18 traditional Garifuna dance, traditional music, Garifuna music. I've added in drama, poetry. Um, we, we do that through um, of the theater or performing arts. Um, usually at the end of a workshop, we put on a, a production um, to um, show what the children, youth, and young adults have learned throughout the four, sometimes uh, five weeks of workshop program. So what propelled me to promote the Garifuna culture or especially the language? In 1968, when I came to America, we tried to assimilate uh, with the Americans until my father says, uh, said to us, since we were living with him uh, at, uh, at the time, met him for the first time, and my mom at the age of 12, um, he said when we um, started living together, you all are only going to speak Garifuna in this house. Well, there goes our um, American assimilation. We had to continue to speak Garifuna. So, but then five years later, uh, my family, um, took us back to Belize in 1973, and five years later, it was to my um, surprise, shock, devastation, disappointment. Nobody that I knew, my friends, my uh, my my friends from school, my neighbors, many folks that we that I knew or that my my sisters and I knew, everyone was now speaking Creole. Wow, I said, I was shocked. So that propelled me to continue to to um, teach the Garifuna language. I don't profess, pro profess to be the greatest Garifuna speaker, but I try and I want to continue to teach that to our youth, children, and to our young adults. What am I working on now currently in Gamay? I am still working on um, uh, transcribing the Disney um, ch um, children's book, such as The Lion King, Nemo, um, uh, those kinds of Disney books. I'm looking to transpose them into Garifuna so that I can have a, a audio book for small, small children so they can hear storybook in Garifuna and, and learn to hear our language and possibly speak our language at an early age. I'm also on my plate is an animation pro program or animation video. I have um, decided to emulate this program called Gracie's Corner. Um, to teach Garifuna, basic, basic Garifuna, some of our, our regular um, Garifuna, um, such as our greetings, busu, we call it, um, some of the things that we know of in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the, ba in the, in, in the living room, basic, basic Garifuna. I believe that the continuous teaching and training of children and youth to learn and acquire the knowledge of, of traditional Garifuna language, um, spirituality, heritage, culture, so that they will use that knowledge to give back to the Garifuna culture 
to promote, protect, preserve, and keep the culture and the language alive. And most important, to help build up our um, community through economic development, if they can, when they grow up, these youth and young adults, and to give back to our Garifuna community today, tomorrow, and every day. My plans and hope for the future is actually a dream. I dream that one day Game International will take over the 800 Carib Reserve that was once owned by Thomas Vincent Ramos and the Garifuna, uh, the non, which was a non-governmental organization. We are hoping to take back that 800 acres to create an all things Garifuna village on that reserve. The all things Garifuna village will include a Garifuna language learning institution, a Garifuna music institution, a Garifuna medicine and health center, a Garifuna performing arts theater, a Garifuna children and youth recreation center, a, a Garifuna Agriculture and Farming Center, a Seamstress, Garifuna Sewing and Seamstress Center, and a Garifuna Furniture and Craft Making Center, and that is just to name a few. It is my hope that Game International will make that dream of mine a reality so that we can give back to our community, keep our language alive, keep our culture alive through the work that I do in Game International. Again, my name is Eleanor Castillo Bullock. I am with Game International Inc. You could find Game on, on, on our, you could check out our website at gameinternational.org. We have a Facebook page, please check it out. Um, I, I can be reached at 732. 895 5960 um, or at my um, Yahoo email at Ellie at yahoo.com. Ellie Bullock at yahoo.com. I thank you for your time. I thank you for um, supporting our organization, Game, and I thank Hen. Um, the Heritage Network of Belize to have invited me to the program. Thank you and have a very nice day. Thank you, Ms. Castillo Bullock for that presentation. Next on our afternoon agenda, we see how our ancestry guides us to promote our heritage. The presentation of the Itzamna Society and the proud Maya heritage, Nohkash Emen Eligio Panti National Park by Mr. Abdon Sib and Miss Maria Garcia sheds light on how ancient information can be shared to the modern day local Maya communities. As a volunteer and past project coordinator for the Itzamna Society, Abdon Sib has seen many challenges that have impacted the way projects are executed and implemented. The Maya culture needs to be highlighted, preserved, exposed, and passed on to the coming generations. The Itzamna Society has done its part, but a lot more work needs to be carried out to fulfill the utmost goal, cultural preservation and conservation of nature for the future generations. We now have our presentation from the Itzamna Society. All right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdon Seb. Uh, sorry that I'm not showing my face. <laughs> uh, okay, so Today I'll be presenting on the Itzamna Society and its proud Maya heritage, the Nohkash Ming Liopanti National Park. All right, so many of you might know the name and I am maybe might not know where it is or have never visited. So today I will cover uh, what the Liopanti National Park has done uh, back in the day and uh, what it continues to do, okay? So we only have 15 minutes time, so I hope I cover as much as I can. 
right. So thanks to Ms. Maria Garcia and the Samna Society um, who helped in um, providing information for um, this presentation. All right. So the picture that you see on the background there, that's the uh, the Sapodilla waterfalls. And later on in the presentation, you will see a video of um. I won't spoil it for you. There's a video about this fall. Okay. Okay. Abstract. All right. So um. The Nohok Ashmeng Indu Panti National Park um, is uh, is an exemplary cultural haven um, for many um, since uh, it provides a history of healing in Belize within the Maya communities, especially by the late Don Alihio Panti. All right, so um, there is a lot of um, valuable practices that have been taking place uh, in the national park itself. Um, it, it doesn't have to do only with healing, of course. Like you know, that there's um, several uh, uh, ceremonies that have been done, carried out um, by our local Maya communities and also like by international uh, Maya healers. They take advantage um, of the opportunity um, to join us in having um, these. These amazing uh, activities in the El Hipanti National Park, but even though all of that has been done, um, there's a lot more conscientious education that needs to be done, right? So we can say that the purpose of the national park can be carried out. Um, <clears throat> this is a famous quote, not famous really, but um, it's a favorite quote from the late Don El Hipanti and also by um Miss Maria Garcia, right? Um, and it says um tana is a place tana is san antonio sorry i didn't explain that tana is what we call san antonio village it's our home all right <clears throat> so tana is a place where children are handed down the traditions and knowledge of their ancestors it is a place where communion with nature is understood and honored it is a place where our yucatec language is spoken daily <clears throat> it is a place where children follow their parents into the rain forest in search of healing herbs and the past is brought to life via the words of the elders we open the door to the past as well as to the future we also open the door to true self-sufficiency through plant and harvesting that is sacred done with prayer and thanksgiving this allows our lives to be rich and whole so this is one of the things that um that Ponte national park stands for right? because all of the knowledge will be passed on and it is not done only by us but it's done by the the elders and also the history behind it. Right. <clears throat> so the El Hiopanti National Park was established um, back in 2001 um, with the main purpose, of course, to fulfill the wishes of uh, the late Don El Hiopanti, and which, in his words, was to protect and preserve the medicinal plants used by him and the ancient people within the national park. <clears throat> right. So back in there are history of um, our people back in the day lived here. Uh, there are uh, traces of evidence everywhere with the caves and uh, all the, the the ancient pottery that exists in there right all their ceremonies that that are done right there there are traces of um of the ashes that they left behind right so um we can see that um even now that um we continue to practice this um it has been carried out for millennia right so and also, another goal is to um, to protect the valuable resources of our ancestors, which dwell deep within the forest. There are hidden sites um, under the canopy, and uh, we just cannot see it with our bare eyes, right? As most of you know, that the lidar actually helped to uncover most of these things, um, most of the hidden gems, we can say. Right? So, um, fortunately, um, the Alihapanti National Park um, has a lot of, of valuable. Uh, cultural resources in there and um, here I remember I told you about the Sapodilla waterfalls so here you have um, a video um, showing the Sapodilla waterfalls right so this what you see here these are all Sapodilla trees that surround the waterfall and that's where it got its name right this is an unedited video So you heard all the, 
the birds in the in the background there. Right, so this is what it means to wake up in the jungle with the, with, the, with nature. Right, so um, we can say that um, Islamic society has succeeded um, in many ways, but one of them is to provide education to a lot of people. Right, uh, so back in the day we have had uh, cultural activities. Say that we had um, ceremonies happening. We had a primicia uh, happening for when Islam society got back the, the national park back in 2019 right actually it's September 26th so it's a it's been three years 19 20, 21, 22. yeah it's been three years since um Islam society acquired the the co-management of the Leopante National Park again right but um in educational groups uh, we have had um, several um, groups from led by FCD and uh, we also have had groups from the local schools, the surrounding schools, and um, we have had groups from um, like that had workshops at the national park, right? And also um, the latest group we had was a group from uh, UB, right, University of Belize. And thanks to Dr. Piyosaki, who um, took the initiative of taking the the, the students there which of course was a marvelous experience for them and you'll see why in just a bit okay so um, we also have created alliances with other educational institutions um, or relevant authorities right which uh, that would be like niche that would be like um, like Hen right thanks to Hen and the group of ladies that manage it and also um, we have had um, with like tour groups like tour guides and resorts and um, other stakeholders so all of this um, is a very valuable experience for everyone that attends the Elihopanti National Park. All right, so here, as I mentioned before, um, on the top left, there's a group of the environmental club uh, with our rangers, right? Um, the UB's environmental club. And on the top right, there's a, a group of children led by um, Mr. Justin Hook. Thanks, Mr. Justin. Um, like he took a group of students to experience the Leopanti National Park and teach them about ecology and ecology protection. Right? And um, this will lead, of course, like to, to protecting uh, for the young children to be aware of how to contribute to nature protection as well. Right? And on the bottom right, you will see a picture of Dr. Piyosaki along with our our rangers, Mr. Aurelio, and Mr. Kenny, and Mr. Yoni, right? And um, they have done a, an amazing job at the Elio County National Park. On the bottom left, uh, there is a picture of um, a friend uh, just enjoying the, the view of the Sapodilla waterfalls. And here I leave you with a surprise, um, which uh, our stu well, the students um, took. Right. They had a, a interesting experience that as just as the lecture was starting, then they discovered this beautiful animal right there. As a shy one, but um. And uh, yeah, so they, they had an uh, interesting experience there. And um, we're so happy that they got to experience that because now we can say that <clears throat> after so much work, um, after three years, uh, we can finally say that, hey, the wildlife is thriving and they're not afraid to join us, <laughs> we can say, or be around us, right? Because back in the day, like, um, remember back in 2019 when we acquired the the co-management of the El Hopanti National Park. Hunting was the biggest issue. <clears throat> but um, 
and it created conflicts with us like trying to to educate and also to, to engage with the farmers and the the, the hunters right it was difficult and um, to get the, the the word across that hey you know this is now we need to protect this um, national park because of these uh, reasons but <clears throat> slowly little by little uh, we we got a hold of it and um looting was another thing that we tried to to um <clears throat> to stop right because because of people going hunting and looting um they destroy many of the the resources that we have in the national park and also another um another activity that hurts the national park from the inside is extracting the valuable resources like um say taking out a lot of medicine or the bay leaves and then not planting any back right so we're just taking and not giving anything to nature again it's we're unbalancing the uh, the environment basically right and also there's a lack of uh, manpower we can say right uh, because going back to the first um, pointer here the encroachment <clears throat> if the boundaries are not protected then uh, the encroachment will continue there's a lot of people that you know need land San Antonio is growing seven miles is growing and um, so they they need somewhere to build their homes and build their farmlands right as you can see in the picture in the background San Antonio village now hosts about 3,000 people <clears throat> and um, we need to to encourage them to, to you know to hey you know like make use of the land you have because the National Park even though like we if we de-reserve it it's gonna be an issue for everyone because um, the National Park provides water like all the natural resources that we need the, the fresh air uh, right and also if the animals get out of the park then you know you can hunt them but you cannot hunt inside of the park um, <clears throat> also um, people they, they're taking land and trying to apply for land inside the National Park inside the boundaries of the National Park and that has become a, an issue right a real conflict for us um, and we have had um, to to um, practice our conflict resolution skills in order for us to um, to assist the, the farmers and um, help the National Park right so um, moment all right so here i leave you uh, i have this video of a of an oscillated turkey which um, just was on the roadside and um, the rangers are trying to go as slow as they can so they don't startle the, the bird and, and um, it's a marvelous experience just to see these there so yeah th those are the things that um that, as i mentioned before um that create a healthier and a, a more um a rich environment for everyone right there are opportunities for growth for everyone and um i can say proudly that we still have a few healers and shaman or men which we call in maya living in our communities right um, unfortunately um we have a lot we had a loss uh, so a couple or a few days ago, um, where Mr. Hino How, one of the, the the best snake bite healers, um, passed away. All right, but um, I can say fortunately that um, he was able to teach some people, and uh, not everything he knows, unfortunately, but he shared some of the knowledge that he had, and also um, we have the stakeholders who um who helped us uh, who help us protect the boundaries right we must um, acknowledge that the the stakeholders like say um, Mystic River Resort and um, the forestry department and even um, the Black Rock River Lodge um, they're they help a lot by protecting our boundaries and um, assisting us in any way um, possible Okay, and also um, we we have, as I mentioned before, with the educational institutions, um, we have a very good bond with several of the institutions, and um, we can say that uh, 
the work will continue with them and also with the tour groups because with the tour groups even though it's just for an hour it's just for like two days visiting the national park you get a lot of information out, outside right and um it gets the national park gets an exposure the knowledge gets out there and um we also get to fulfill the goals of the national park which is to protect and preserve the natural and the cultural resources within it all right so um these are some pictures of miss maria garcia uh when we did the promesia um moment ceremony back in 2019 and uh, we have dr well not doctor but um mr wayne hall he's a good friend uh, who uses his resources um to be able to capture uh, videos of birds right and uh, he you know being a bird lover you get excited to see any bird um right especially like knowing like the the history and uh, the natural history behind the birds it just makes you excited to learn more about them every day and mr wayne hall has done an amazing job at sharing videos of of the birds he encounters all right and um a salamander uh, on the bottom right um this is a, a document was documented back in 2021 uh, from a student uh, from the from my university in the states and um, it's a beautiful creature we're, we're so happy that um, that researchers and biologists are also making part of um, documenting the species that are within the Iliopati National Park and on the bottom left um, you can visit that page um, so you can see more pictures of and of course get more information about the the, uh, the National Park itself right innovative practices training for the villagers so later on um it's on a society has a, a goal of um of training our community members and uh some of the trainings that we're looking into providing are uh fire control right because we're right next to the the um the mountain pine ridge and we also have um pine ridge forest or pine forest we can say in the leopoldi national park so it, it makes it um uh, an asset for us to have people who can control fires right and also there's leadership trainings conflict resolutions um, we need the conflict resolution skills for our villagers and community members and also um, tour guide trainings since the information won't get out there um, if the tour guides don't take people there right so um, it, it is become a it has become a haven for tour guiding which if you visit you will know why right constable trainings um traditional farming trainings on seed bank creation jungle survival forest aid cave rescue jungle rescue all of these will be provided um later on um to our community members and also um the biggest project that we will be working on is to reforest the watershed for san antonio village right and um again uh, drought is a real thing Climate change is a real thing, and all of us have experienced it. And um, we don't want the watershed of our community to dry out. And so we have had this dream of reforesting the watershed. Unfortunately, it's um, closely coming. Going to well, it's going to happen soon. Hopefully, uh, we're not sure how soon, but it's one of the goals that we have as a fresh, like the short-term goals, right? And also, it would be for a long-term use, of course. Right. So with that, um, I leave you with these amazing pictures of the black-headed trogon, the red-capped mannequin, and the uh, ornate hawk eagle. And of course, we cannot forget the primates. Right. So we had the the howler monkeys right next to the visitor center. And also, like to 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 reiterate, um, there's a lot of wildlife in within the national park. Right. And all of these that you see, um, these four living creatures here are were found right next to the visitor center in the Eliopanti National Park. So I hope this um, serves um, served for good information for you and um, thank you. Our next presentation connects 
ecological knowledge with resilience and diversity in a unique and enlightening Hi, Ms. Rosado. I just Hi. need to jump in here for a little Sorry. bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to do a quick little bit of housekeeping for our presenters backstage. Um, we have a small limit for our presenters that are in studio. So we savor this moment for those that are in the initial Q&A session. So the presenters that will be involved in the Q&A session, we allow them to be in studio and then we present them on screen. So we applaud the efforts of everyone that wants to join our studio, but unfortunately we don't have the maximum capacity. But if you definitely want to continue watching our um, presentations, of course, you can catch them on our Heritage Education Network Facebook page and our YouTube page. So I just wanted to pop in here and give that small little housekeeping. Sorry. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. And that is our core director for Heritage Education Network, Belize. So let's move on to our next presentation from Toucan Ridge Ecology and Education Society at Risk Youth Program. This uh, will be presented by Ms. Irma Ramos, who is from the village of La Democracia. She's a local tour guide and naturalist and grew up surrounded by a family that valued Belize's natural heritage and culture. Along with her brothers and cousins, she learned practical bush skills and appreciation for wildlife. Her family members have worked long-term providing research assistance skills for several local NGOs, including Panthera, UBRI, and WCS. Irma has a deep respect for Belizean wildlife and nature and has a vast knowledge of medicinal and nutritional uses of local plants and fruits. In 2016, she started the at-risk youth program at Trees under her capacity as farm manager. She hopes to impart practical life skills and knowledge of our natural heritage and culture to youth at risk of gang violence in hopes of funneling youth potential into valuable services for our society through organic farming, science, art, and culture. She has already enriched the lives of several of her guests as a tour guide and now hopes to foster the youth of Belize to impart the same appreciation of Belize and its natural heritage. My name is Glacelle Marin and I'm the internship coordinator and a researcher at the Toucan Ridge Ecology and Education Society, or TREES for short. Today you will hear about our at-risk youth program, which was started in response to the growing problem of gang violence in the La Democracia village in central Belize. In 2021, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that this problem was exacerbated by the switching of school to an online platform. The lack of infrastructure in this village, coupled with other issues such as parents losing their jobs, resulted in a marked increase in school dropouts in the village. We took this as an opportunity to focus our efforts at TREES on our at-risk youth program. Research from Herbert Gale has shown that Belize has an extremely high school exclusion rate, which has to be treated as a core contributing factor to the gang problem in Belize. According to the Epidemiological Unit of the Ministry of Health, the Belize district is the epicenter of violence in the country. Data from the Belize Police Department show that Belize is the most problematic district with active turf wars being fought by youth. This is why Irma Ramos, resident of La Democracia, took up mentorship of La Democracia Roots Youth Group and began a program at Trees where youth learn practical skills and capacity building in organic farming techniques, wildlife ecology, animal and wildlife appreciation, dance and music. Research from Krista Deguer suggests that positive adult members can greatly assist in gang disengagement by providing emotional support and concrete resources such as safe housing, jobs, and education. Herbert Gale further stresses the importance of these socializing agents in equipping a child to become a competent and functioning member of society. 
I now turn you over to Mr. Emmett Young and Ms. Irma Ramos, co-instructors of the Trees at Risk Youth Program, to share some of the program's successes and introduce you to some of our youth who will be sharing their testimonials about the program. My name is Emmett Young and I'm originally from Gears Point, Manatee and I love to work with kids. I am a drum maker, drum teacher and pro farmer. What's the importance of integrating culture and art in the program? Um, it's very important to integrate culture and art into youth program because the youths get to know who they are, they can learn about their culture, and then they have um, more confidence in themselves and they get proud of their culture and want to share it with others. observations on the interaction between youth and music um the music is very important in youth's life i know because it stimulates their brain it builds up their self-confidence it gives them a sense self purpose and belonging because with the music especially with drumming they have to work together because it's not an individual thing it's a together thing so it really uh, good for youths themselves and they also with the knowledge where we share with them they get to go to other communities and meet other youth mm -hmm. so that's the benefit and see how other youth behave or act you know and also they get to leave their community which is very important have you noticed a difference in the youth from the beginning of the program until now um yeah i um that's what keep me going because a lot of times when we started out, they are very close. They are not open, especially male, because a lot of times male are taught to hide emotions. And so by them hiding emotions, they're free to release and tell you their problem. Sometimes they have a lot of problem and anger build up inside. Maybe by the middle of the program, they've been telling me stuff that they, they are holding in, that they, they want to release long time, but wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the jumps not gone. Is a movement that I founded over 14 years ago in my village nice. where we promote non violence to music, art, and culture. What had happened in about eight months, we bury about eight youths, mm -hmm. so that's like one a month. So, and then the guys, them that they was all from my village and they go into the city and join gangs, and then they would come back to the village and then they would be shooting guns over the grave. And I said, that's not a good way to honor a youth. So we come up with the idea. We had a restaurant, me and my wife. And I said I should go down to the um, cemetery and play my jump. And that's when we come up with the idea of jumps not guns. That's what I'm doing, the jumps not guns. It's a movement, jumps not guns is a movement. Hi, my name is Irma Ramos. I'm 45 years young. <laughs> I am from La Democracia Village and I'm the so-called founder of the at Youth Risk Program in La Democracia. Uh, we were a 4-H group whereby we do a lot of community service, cleaning the community, especially our rivers, um, streams. For some years now, 4-H um, forget about us. <laughs> and of course, well, we can't stop it. We just continue going and we create, I create the At Risk Youth Program. And since I'm here at Trees, I gotta say thanks to Matt and Vanessa. They opened the entire place for us. Hey Irma, you have your youth there and they're not doing anything. You can bring them here. And of course, we have place for them to stay nice cozy cabins. Mm -hmm. 
you know <laughs> they eat three meals a day mm -hmm. learning how to do organic farming learning to make something out of nothing mm -hmm. or what they have mm -hmm. i'm here at trees and and there's not really anybody in the community that cares about them or mm -hmm. even try to create anything for them to do so so the program is following you pretty yeah. much yeah pretty much <laughs> Do you see that the returning youth are excited to come back? Exciting. Exciting as ever. <laughs> Any holiday, mm -hmm. they be calling. Zerma or Auntie Ma, what we gonna do? You have anything so we do? Nothing really happened. <laughs> what happened, you know? Is something you've gained from the experience and how will you apply it to working with other youth? Well, honestly, I'm seeing that these kids are crying out for things to do. There is nothing happening for them. And I, I notice that whatever we throw out there to them, it doesn't matter if it's hard work, easy work, dirty work, <laughs> they're grabbing it <laughs> just for something to happen for them. Until they find the thing they really love to do and then I think they'll be yeah, but right now they're searching. And some of them are getting the opportunity to come out here learning about organic farming. Because most of us is used to farming with fertilizer. And the skin can grow, we're going to throw some fertilizer. But now they know that they can go home, they scrap food, the stuff that the animal doesn't eat. They can let those things decompose and turn into soil and they can use it around. They plant, they cut their yard, they know they don't need to burn the grass anymore. Let those pile them up, let them dry, and then you can use them around your fruit trees or um, in your garden. So from the youth that you've seen this in, have you noticed that maybe those that are more likely to be negatively influenced, are they being, are they changing their opinions and who they're spending time with and their activities that they're choosing? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I notice some of them is in that, that position with them, but why they want to pick up the leader skills, you know, like when Kalisha Jones, she wants to be the head girl that teach them how to dance, you know. Jerusalem, Ikayalami, Ilondolose. Jerusalem, Ikayalami, Ilonolose, Uhambenami, Zungangishilana, Dauyami, Aikolana, Busoami, Aukolana. have Amir, Amir Anna. He's we we had select Amir to be the leader in the village. That when we're when I'm not there, he is the man who is supposed to get everybody together. We got more youths coming out now, more female, you know. Well, my name is Amir Anna. I'm 18 years old. I am from La Democracia Village, and I am the group leader of the La Democracia Roots. How do you encourage other youth to join the program? When I'm here at Trees, I usually take pictures of work that we do voluntarily here and I send them to them and they get interested. They want to come and hang out and work and, you know, volunteer with me. Do you see a change in the interaction between participants when they're at home after the program? Yeah. Yeah, they're really good at it. Uh, they learn things when they learn home. Yeah. Uh, they cook at home. Uh, teach their younger siblings. Do you ever talk about the outcome of the program with each other after the, after it's completed? 
Well, most likely, yes, we will sit together in a group and we will talk about the things we do. People say they love it, they want to come back, and they love trees. It makes me interact with kids more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get, get to being around kids that is younger than me. Influence them to work hard. Mm -hmm. Like I do. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, my name is Gore. I'm from La Democracia. Okay. My name is Tyrone. I am from La Democracia Village. And you? My name is Fenton. And I'm from Hattieville. Okay. How old are you guys? 15. 14. 13. 13. Wait, don't I over and put it at the boys? Okay, do it again. 14. <laughs> Hi, my name is Fianna Garello. Hi, my name is Carol Palacio. My name is Jason Estrada. My name is Andrea Palacio. My name is Kalisha Jordan. My name is Kelly Bailey. My name is Carol Palacio. I'm from La Democracia and I'm 17 years old. I'm, I'm from La Democracia and I'm 14 years old. I'm from La Democracia and I'm 15 years old. I'm from La Democracia and I'm 9 years old. I'm from La Democracia and I'm 16 years old. Yeah. Tell me what Anna like about trees. I like how we always have fun playing volleyball and go work. I call it teacher new things. New things? Everything um surrounding and the learning things. I like that you're still in the mountains. I like that you come come to work, you for the work. I like I learn to be dumb a lot. I learn to be good. And I learn to plant. And I learn all the types of stuff. I learn about planting new trees and the different steps of the drum and the trails. I learn how to beat drums and plant trees. I learn how to root cassava and use it in different ways. For example, making cassava flour, cassava fries, um, root syrup, all different types of stuff. What's your favorite wildlife experience? Oh, when we hold the yaki yaki frog. When we say two snakes. You said two snakes? Coffee snake. Yeah, coffee snake. snake. Yeah, coffee snake. Yeah. snake. Um, one of my favorite experiences was seeing the red eye tree frog for the first time and seeing three snakes when we were cleaning one of the trails. Most women like both it and everything and I walk back. Thank you to the Heritage Education Network of Belize for the opportunity to participate in this culture symposium. Ms. Irma and Mr. Emmett will now take your questions about the Trees at Risk Youth program. Thank you for that lovely presentation, Ms. Irma. We will now move on to wrapping up day two of our culture symposium with our presentation on resiliency, resilient beliefs, envisioning climate justice for Mesoamerican reef communities. This is presented by Ms. Adriana Chavez, who is an adjunct assistant professor and holds a master's degree from Harvard Graduate School of Design in Urbanism, Landscape and Ecology. She also holds a master in architecture. She graduated in 2014 and was a recipient of the Urban Project Prize. She is the co-founder of ORU, Office for Urban Resilience, a design think tank that focuses on implementing innovative solutions for cities through urban design and landscape infrastructure with a water sensitive approach. She holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City, where she graduated with honors in 2008. We now have the presentation from Ms. Adriana Chavez. And just as a gentle reminder, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat so that we can answer your questions during the Q&A session, which will follow this presentation. 
we will move on with our presentation on resilient Belize. For joining us today. I am Adriana Chavez, a faculty member at Columbia University. I'm going to present the studio Resilient Belize, Envisioning Climate Justice for Mesoamerican Reef Communities, developed during the spring semester of 2022 at the Master in Architecture and Urban Design within Columbia's University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. The studio was a collaboration with the Columbia University Center for Resilient Cities and Landscape, the University of Belize, the government of Belize through Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute and the Resilient Reefs Initiative from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Before moving into the presentation, I also want to acknowledge the faculty team, Kate Orff, the studio coordinator, Gita Meta, Tarios Polowski, Lorena Bello, Victoria Bono, and Joanna Lovecchio, along the 43 students from the GSAP MAUD class of 2022. In this presentation, you'll see a short recap of some of the projects developed and presented by former students and teaching assistants, Cesar, Abani, Carmen, Galina, and Lucas. Our studio look at the Mesoamerican Reef System and their communities by testing the implementation of water sensitive coastal zoning proposed by the Belize Coastal Zone Management Plan in a range of sites and systems to iterative special design. We work across coastal transects that include upland tropical forest protection measures to new urban design opportunities, sustainable fisheries management to innovative green infrastructure finance models and reef restoration. The studio kick off with an immersive workshop to understand the challenges from experts in the environmental, spatial and social issues in Belize. Here in the screen, you can see some of our guest speakers and stakeholders. Now I'm going to get on to see. Thank you, Adriana. During the workshop, we learned that Belize is a success story and the role model in climate and biodiversity action. The precedent efforts inspired us to develop these 12 design principles for the studio that responded directly to the reef resilience assessment under three large umbrellas, ecosystems, community, and governance. It is important to say that Belize cultural and environmental diversity is a global treasure that hosts the Mesoamerican Reef, the largest barrier system in the Western Hemisphere, making it part of the world's cultural heritage. Coastal communities rely on this diverse ecosystem for protection from storms and erosion, local jobs, recreation, and food production. But this treasure is being threatened. Climate change has greatly endangered flora and fauna in Belize. Sea level is expected to rise between around um, 12 inches in the next 30 years. All of these threatens the coral reefs and mangroves forest, causes extensive coastal edge erosion, a literal forest loss endangering the, li the livelihoods of not only sea life, but humans that depend on the delicate system in Belize. From the perspective of tourism, community, uh, industry, ecology, we located 11 sites that engage in of these complex issues to test our 12 design principles in a range of spatial conditions. We determined five umbrella policies for coastal development and directed design proposals based on the specific characteristics of the sites. As a whole, we call for Climate Reparations Fund to invest on systems for resilience, and the other four umbrella policies define clusters of proposals that will be presented today. Let's start with the first one, Avni. The first umbrella policy, the Caribbean Sustainable Tourism Pact, explores policies for that support the local economy while supporting Belize's heritage and natural environment. The Caribbean islands act as critical infrastructure that shelter and protect Mexico and Belize from wind, waves, and hurricanes. As you can see from the red lines, a majority of the hurricanes lose their intensity as they hit the mainland. However, extractive pressures of tourism and real estate speculation have disrupted these natural ecosystems. To combat this, we propose a national park alliance composed of the barrier islands that designates them as protected areas. 
Using Key Cocker as a pilot site, this proposal seeks to revile the existing dredged harbors and cleared lands through a framework of knowledge production, conservation, and scientific tourism. By 2080, as you can see, the island will have fully transitioned to a resilient habitat through instituting managed retreat, creating a living coastline, and restoring mangrove cover. Three main strategies are used to restore the connections from ridge to reef ecosystem. Existing buildings are retrofitted and adapted to combat sea level elevated walk. Mangrove nurseries around the island accelerate their growth and restore forest cover. Working together at the harbor's edge, the, this integrated mangrove ecosystem provides nurseries for fishes and enriches the marine life. Systems of climate monitoring, hurricane warning, weather tracking, and carbon sequestration all provide data on how to create this dynamic living edge. Tools of community science are used to increase civic engagement and empower the local community. Integrating into existing systems, the new residential clusters accommodate homestays, allowing the tourists to immerse themselves within the local culture. Communal dining around local food production and production of local handicrafts strengthens social bonds, enabling stronger interaction between the locals, tourists, and nature. Further along this transect are underwater field sites for conducting scientific diving protocols, monitoring the intertidal zone and reef health, and coral hospitals to understand processes of recovery and conservation. Using this long-term landscape-based framework, we build on and amplify synergies across ecology, economy, and culture. The future resilient landscape blurs boundaries between human and natural, restoring the inherent interconnectedness of systems. Now moving on to cluster policy two, Galina. Um, thank you, Avani. So in our second umbrella policy, we explore opportunities for land tenure security and local stewardship to generate wealth within communities through a national framework for community land trust. And this project um, that I'm going to explain explores adaptive strategies in central Belize from Belize City to Belmopan. And in our research, we discovered a World Bank publication illustrating a top-down master plan for Belize City. And this concept is an example of a master plan that would continue to degrade uh, crucial ecological assets and heritage and cause flooding inequalities for local communities. Um, in contrast, we propose a living corridor to form along both the Western Highway and the Saiban Belize River watersheds to connect Belizeans to concentrated public works and municipal resources. Um, so we propose a long-term resilience framework that prepares for climate change and sustain sustains growth growth in central Belize by implementing three core strategies um, that are adaptive. This includes a decarbonized corridor, community land trust, and nature-based growth. Within Belize City, we have three proposed sites that include the local fishers market and nearby bus station, which marks one end of the regional corridor. And the third site takes place in a low-income neighborhood at the edge of an um, urban and mangrove forest. And our first site really includes the existing Conchelle Bay fish market um, and the surrounding neighborhood, which is currently affected by flooding. So by 2030, we, we propose to establish a Hollow River Creek land trust that will work with voluntary households to move away from flood prone areas while retrofitting existing houses for adaptation. And so by rethinking our relationship to water, existing structures may be adapted as amphibious structures or floating structures to expand market and pavilion space, creating a vibrant waterfront park in 2080. Naturalized water edges would be able to absorb storm surges and create a multimodal infrastructure that really doubles as recreational use. And our second site um, is located at the existing bus terminal. With the current transportation infrastructure currently strained in Belize, we envision an expanded transit hub that would be adapted with renewable energy sources and social infrastructures. Um, so really in our vision, transit hubs will be established as a public investment anchor across corridor communities, which can grow to include social amenities and training center to benefit the local economy, linking communities along the Western Highway corridor. 
Um, so in 2080, we believe Belize City transportation infrastructure can be decarbonized and settlement patterns redefined by limiting urban sprawl and establishing an, an ecological growth boundary. And finally, um, our third site is the Holover Creek Land Trust, which is located in a low-income neighborhood in Belize City. And this trust uh, really aims to stabilize affordable housing options for local residents, while also adapting existing structures for, from storm surge. Um, so by establishing a community land trust framework, we set in motion tools to adapt in place um, and equitably, equitably densify Belize City. And so by leveraging the existing Western Highway and Holliver Creek infrastructure, we can really establish a co-beneficial relationship between urban and corridor communities. Now I will pass it on to Lucas to discuss, discuss the blue economy. Thank you. So based on the blue economy, three groups were looking into ecosystem repair and restoration, land and marine conservation, renewable energy, sustainable fisheries, but most importantly, ways to reduce our carbon footprint. Our group had San Pedro as a study site, and we started by zooming in on four different site conditions we were dealing with in the town, comparing satellite images from 1984 and now. The main differences over time are loss of public space, sea level rise, the hardening of short edges, and intense densification. So together with Yasmin, Julia, and Sam, our goal was that through urban design and technology, we could transition from ghost reefs to coral nurseries coupled with renewable energy sources, such as offshore wind turbines. And getting to zero emissions and being independent means changing from fossil fuels towards clean energy that is nested within the urban fabric while adapting and mitigating external factors. Our in-water strategies included a combination of floating solar panels modules and ecological systems, sitting in a lagoon surrounded by mangrove nurseries, nurseries for eco ecological restoration. When fully implemented, it would offset any energy imported from Mexico. Our second strategy was an offshore wind farm, taking advantage of the high concept inst winds. The turbines would be located near the coral barrier to help create an artificial reef system. On the other hand, inland strategies reimagined San Pedro as an enriched public realm that existed alongside nature-based practices. A transitional landscape with dense mangrove vegetations in between elevated pathways would allow for bird habitats, fisheries production, and carbon sequestration, in addition to areas for cultural expression and exports activities. At the town course center, the vehicle accessible streets aim for 50% more permeable surfaces and an enlarged central biosphere to filter rainstorms. In the future, parcel by parcel ground for retreat might also be necessary depending on sea level rise with a trade-off for zoning easements that allowed for building an additional floor above. <clears throat> and finally, on the other side, the new enhanced shore side would be able to bring energy into the public eye with photovoltaic shading devices, electric boats, and water collection within pavilions, while a shorter beach with elevated boardwalks in the future could provide for protection against rising waters. It could also channel water into proper Danish networks. So now for our last umbrella policy, Carmen. Thank you. Uh, in our final umbrella policy, Ridge to Reef National Park, we address poor waste management causing downstream water pollution, as well as physical boundaries that can also act as major political boundaries. The proposed binational park extends out from the Rio Hondo connecting Mexico and Belize, where the shape of the park follows the watershed and projected floodline to buffer the river's edge from agricultural runoff and development. Within the park, we propose ecotourism through foot trails as well as a bus route shown in the red loop that utilizes the existing highway infrastructure to connect our chosen pilot sites of Santa Elena, Chan Chen, and Sak Chan. To establish our vision, we are proposing a series of chronological strategies that first establishes a binational park, which the Rio Hondo watershed is no longer recognized as a physical division, rather an unbounded binational connection that extends the porous radiance of communal spirit and culture to allow countries from opposing sides to learn to learn from one another. We imagine the introduction of a local coalition center that would serve as the catalyst in preparation and becoming a receiver town in the future events of sea level rise. 
Shown here are one of the proposed coalition centers on the site of Santa Elena to implement ecological and communal strategies. This image is a projected future of the site in which mangrove restoration has been successfully implemented within the community to improve water quality, bringing back former ecology such as the highlighted manatee that typically migrates down the Rio Hondo. Each one of these sites is anchored as a connection through the establishment of the coalition centers, which serves as spaces to interact and learn. Within each coalition center, education, research, and congregational moments invite the community to come together. As time progresses, the sea level rise would become a more threatening reality. The introduction of coalition centers creates a community hub within the area that would strengthen connections between villages along the Rio Hondo and prepare to receive an influx of people from coastal cities. Mexico and Belize both sit on the Yucatan Peninsula, which is rich in Mayan culture. Shown in the drawing is the Saba tree and, Mayan and the Mayan pyramid, both of which serves as nodes of knowledge that emphasize community and ecological importance. The Mayans developed their own calendar in which the Tun equates to one year, Katun 20 years, and Bakatun 395 years, which is centered around the ecosystems rather than that of the human lifespan. Mayan culture emphasizes how we as humans are a part of various systems considering considering that each is interconnected, informs, influences, and inspires the next. Thank you so much for listening to us. We will share with you a link to our studio story maps so you can explore the full series of proposals with detail. And we look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you for that presentation. And we had the whole team presenting, which is lovely. Uh, we will now be taking questions, and so we will be asking the presenters to come on screen. All right. Thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. We will now be taking um, I'm not sure what's causing this. Perhaps we can, we can mute our mics. Okay, great. Yes, that was the issue. Okay, thank you very much for being here with us. And thank you for those that are viewing. We will now take questions. And we will start with a question for Mr. Abdon Sib. And the question reads, Mr. Abdon, do you find many sandy locations like in the video in the park? Um, that's a good question. Normally, like beside the river, well, the Privacy Creek, um, which where you can find the, the Sapodilla Falls, um, are. Mainly because the, the, like, the rocks it that come that Mr. Abdon's video has frozen. Oh, you're back. Yes. Please go ahead, Mr. Can you, can you hear me? All right. All right, then. So, yeah, like I was saying, like usually, like upstream of the Privacion uh, Creek, there is a lot of granite, right? So the granite comes from, well, it has a lot of silica, and, of course, like once it washes, um, uh, you'll find a lot of sand um, deposits on the side of the of the creek or the, the rivers. And even like when you're going towards like the Macal River, um, where the Prevostion um, River discharges, um, you, you find a lot of sand there. So if you go to like the, the um, uh, I forgot the name of the, the tour, the tour you go on, um, on the, the, the little, um, anyway, forget it. There's a, like, a lot of like a shores of the Prevostion Creek, yes. There's a lot of them. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have another question. What support do you envision for EPNP to be able to better manage in a sustainable manner? Okay, so um, that's a very good question. In my personal experience, um, the best support that one can give um, is actually like to contribute to education. For example, uh, back in 2019, um, the Elihu Pantin National Park along with its Samna Society 
Um, we hosted several cultural uh, presentations, um, like we had, well, presentations and also activities. Um, this included the traditional medicine uh, workshop, and also it included the ceremonial um, activity, uh, just the, the same way like our ancient people used to do. All right, so we went to ask permission, we got permission from um, Niche, and we carried out this um, workshop. So this enabled people to understand um, the processes um, of the, the ancient um, practices, right? Um, so I would say that education is, is the best way to, to, um, to support the Alejo Panti National Park. And of course, um, monetary uh, funds, um, of course, are not necessary um, to keep the maintenance of the National Park, of course. Thank you, Mr. Zib. Our next question is for Ms. Irma and Emmett. How do you inspire the youth to stay with your program? What we're doing and if they want to be a part of it. And as you see in our video, there's not much happening for them. We have a lot of people out there supporting them. So, and it's at trees. They need somewhere to go. Let's do it. You know, and, and honestly, there are more people coming in from different districts. There are more people from different districts who are asking, can they be involved with the program? So it sounds like it has become quite popular through word of mouth. The, the program itself. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And I hear that with the low ac activities, the availability of activities, your program is pretty much self promoting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Right. Our next question is for any of the presenters. What are some actionable steps for individuals to make to achieve the goals of? a diverse, resilient, and sustainable belief. And this one is open. Positivity. Our next, thank you, thank you, um, Ms. Irma. Our next question um, is directed to our team of presenters on reefs. And this question reads, how will this project affect people who already live in the areas? So either Ms. Kalina, Avani, or Lucas can answer this question. Sure, I can jump in and then Galina and Lucas please add. But I think this proposal that we envisioned as a studio, it is an academic exercise and something that was really important to us was thinking about the people who already live there and what are their practices, what are their traditions, what is the culture and heritage. So a lot of this was trying to take from practices we already saw in the area and enhancing those um, and kind of putting it in a framework of education and collaboration across different communities and groups. Um, yeah, and if Lucas and Galina want to add to that. Sure, I can I can jump on quickly. Um, so yeah, based on Avani said, like each project, so we had 11 sites, right? So like each project, not only the design side, but also to try to figure out who could implement the strategies who could be involved in each phase from implementation, maintenance, like how to get locals involved and not be like an exterior thing. That's why we also had the workshop at the beginning. And also responding to the first, the previous questions, like what individuals can make. I think it was a common thread between all the projects, like the, the educational side and try to like understand and, and search who are the, the existing groups, the local groups. And try to get involved with that and like actually spread the word of what's already being done 
Yeah, I just want to jump in here. I think what Lucas and Avani are, are speaking to, which is the collaboration with local community is so important. And um, I think some of the stronger projects that were in the studio, and I, I can share the um, story map that has all of the projects, those were just a few, um, were really the ones that collaborated with local communities and were more of a grassroots um, approach as opposed to top down. Thank you. And this is another uh, question that can be for any of the presenters. Uh, this is about inspiration. What inspired you to become involved in this project? And I'd like to hear from all, from uh, both of our, sorry, any of our three main presentations today. So uh, Mr. Imran, Mr. Emmett, Abdon, and our team, um, Galina, Avani, Lucas, what inspired you to get involved in this project? But what inspired me is, is the young people. They 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 willing of wanting to do stuff. That's what inspired me and, and they don't give up too easily. That's what inspired me. Thank you. Um, I'm done. Tell us tell us about it. Alright, so um in my in my uh in my case, uh, what inspired me the most is, is like growing in a village where there's lush jungle. Right, so the resources that um, that we get from the forest and um, and also like the practices that has been passed on to us by our ancestors and um, even like where my grandfather um, teaches us how to use uh, medicine and how to extract um, resources from the forest properly. Um, that's what inspired me to to study um, conservation and also to to, to, to teach about it. Um, mostly, like I I root myself into what my my um, culture, like Maya culture, does. Right, uh, like how we carry out the practices of um, of the ancient people, and also like the way we um, share the, the information. Um, it's good, also good to mention. Um, that Frank, uh, who did the presentation yesterday, is my younger brother. Um, so he teaches people about the hieroglyphs. He teaches people about um, about uh, the cultural, um, like our language, the Maya Tang or the um, the Yucatec Maya, right? And and so like I I started back in the day, but I'm damn happy that he took on <laughs> that 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 um I can say that that task. And for me. Um, it inspires me to when I see younger people um, that are teaching, like uh, a large group, group, and uh, like it, it helps them to to understand that uh, our culture, cultural values, um, need to be shared, and also like it needs to spread, so that um, it will survive, you know, just like it has for thousands of years. That's my main inspiration. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. So, no, just wanted to like a little bit of the background of how the studio works as well. It's like it happens once a year, and every year they choose one city globally where the students will be like studying for four to five months. And in our case, it was Belize, and usually everyone travels to the site during the first month, but that couldn't happen for us due to COVID. There were so many travel restrictions. But then we had the, the one week workshop. They were like morning to evening, only talking to local stakeholders and students from the University of Belize and professor from the university too. And I think everyone sort of like felt how personal, like how personally connected people were to the topics that were being discussed of climate justice and sort of like bought the, the, the fight like on our own as well, like a bit. Um, I could jump in here. Uh, I, I think one thing that inspired me to even um, join the program and, and work on, on such topics of, of ecological resilience and community organizing um, is to really make 
make things more equitable. And I think climate change, uh, one thing we learned is that climate change disproportionately is a, uh, impacting the global south. And so I, I think it's um, it's important to study these places and work with local communities to, to really address this inequity. And um, that's what inspires me. Thank you. Thank you for your responses to that question on inspiration. We now have Ms. Eleanor Castillo Bullock joining us uh, during the question and answer segment. And Ms. Eleanor, we have a question here for you. Do you find that your work is helping to change historical stereotypes? Not quite. I wouldn't say that my work is quite there yet um, because historic, I believe that historical stereotypes are pretty ingrained in our society. And it's very difficult for, um, I would call us a grassroots organization like what I run to kind of uh, to to get in there, um, the this 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 the stereotypes are just far too gone, I would think, than for uh, for us to be able to make a change of to change these things. We 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 still continue to try because it never hurts to to try, and we will not give up. Um, but the work that I do, it's not hitting that not to, not that i i don't feel that it is but thanks for asking can you tell us a little bit about the positive impact that you feel that your work is doing um i i feel the positive inf impact that i feel that that I, that i'm doing at this time is to find, get our youth and young adults, especially children then, children interested in wanting to preserve our Garifuna language. Um, we do classes online and, and they come, um, they, and they're eager to come. As a, and as a matter of fact, some of them tell other friends. Um, so that is um, pretty positive to see that our children and our youth and young adults are very interested in trying to help us preserve our Garifuna language. Thank you, Ms. Eleanor. Thank you for answering that question. Thank now you, we will we'll move on to wrap up our Q&A session. Uh, thank you for being with us here today and answering our questions. And thank you for your inspirational presentations into what you're doing with our communities. It is so valuable and your condition, your contributions, I think my brain is tired. Your contributions are so valuable to our communities. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for viewing the second day of our symposium. We will reconvene for day three tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Belize time. Remember that we have one more day of presentations left, so tune in. And we will be streaming the conference live on our Facebook and YouTube channels. So you can tune in again tomorrow. Um, at any time by clicking the link on our page. Before we leave, Heritage Education Network Belize would like to thank our media partner, Colorblind Multimedia Productions for rebroadcasting this symposium. And if you enjoy today's presentation and would like to see more events like this in the future, don't forget to support HenB by donating on the Heritage Education website. The link and the information will Will show. So thank you very much for being here with us today and we'll see you tomorrow for one more day of our <laughs> culture symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.